What's up developers, it's Dory here and welcome back to a new video where we're going to start a mini series about Filament PHP, which is a Laravel package that allows you to quickly and easily build admin panels, where you can then manage data and resources. Now one of the reasons that Filament PHP got so popular is because of the stack it uses. Filament PHP has been completely built with a tall stack, which stands for Tailwind CSS, a utility for a CSS framework for quickly styling web apps, Alphine.js, which is a lightweight JavaScript framework. Obviously, it uses Laravel, which is a PHP web framework. And finally, it uses LifeWire, which is also a Laravel package, which is useful when you want to build dynamic web interfaces using server-side rendering. All these packages and frameworks create the tall stack. And the tall stack is popular because it allows developers to quickly create modern, dynamic web applications using familiar technologies. A while ago I created a Laravel Nova series which pretty much does the same as Filament PHP. Unlike Laravel Nova, which is a paid product, Filament PHP provides a similar solution at no cost. The biggest difference between those stack-wise, well, Laravel Nova uses Laravel, Vue.js, and Inertia for front-end. Other than that, they both use Tailwind CSS and Laravel. Now honestly, I don't want to start a comparison between two admin panels. Both are amazing and deserve a complete course without mentioning their differences. So this will basically be the last time Laravel Nova is mentioned. One thing that I like about Filament PHP is the fact that they have a free demo available. If I navigate to the browser, you will see that I have opened demo.filamentphp.com. Right here, you will see an awesome demo of what Filament PHP allows you to build. So you might wonder, what will we be doing? Well, we're going to build pretty much the same admin panel with the same examples. Now quick note, next to the demo, they offer incredible documentation which you can find through the homepage. Right here, you can click on documentation in the navbar, get started, and you can look up anything that you need. Take your time and pause the video for a moment, go over the functionalities and features, see how the documentation works if you want to, and start the video when you're ready to start the installation process. Before you start with this tutorial, I pretty much assume that you have created some kind of application before in Laravel. So we're not going to spend too much time setting up a Laravel project, setting up a database connection, and so on. Since I store my demo projects in a workspace directory that I have stored on my desktop, I simply need to install a Laravel project through Composer or the Laravel installer tool. So let's get started. Let's say Composer create dash project. We're gonna add the dash dash prefer dash this option. We're gonna install Laravel forward slash Laravel. And since this video is sponsored by Hostinger, I'm going to name my project Hostinger dash filament. All right, let's hit enter and let's create our Laravel project. The installation process has been done successfully. We do need to change directories into our newly created project since filament PHP needs to be installed right inside of it. So let's change directories through the CD command where we need to change directories into our hostinger dash filament project. So let me write down clear, all right. At the moment of recording, Filament PHP just released a beta version of their version 3. A beta version is a pre-release version of software that is made available to users for testing purposes. The reason why it's still in beta is because LiveWire version 3's beta version got released, and Filament PHP depends on LiveWire. Honestly, I've tested it before and it seems as stable as it could be, which is also one of the reasons why I just wanted to start this video series. So the first thing that we need to do is updating our LiveWire version to version 3, which we can do by saying composer, require, livewire, forward slash livewire, where we then need to define the version. So let's say double quotes, caret 3.0 at beta, double quotes. Once we hit enter, you'll see that it's installing version 3. All right, now filament PHP needs to be installed through Composer. So let's perform the composer require command. The package has been created by filament, forward slash filament. We're not done yet because we do need to add a column right here, double quotes, well a set of double quotes, and inside of it, we need to specify to composer which version we want to use. And the version is once again caret 3.0, which basically means that any version of filament PHP equal or greater than 3.0 dash stable needs to be installed. One more thing, 
outside of our double quotes, we're going to add the dash capital W flag, which is used to thread warnings as errors, which can help prevent potential issues during installation. All right, uh, let's hit enter, and this should install filament PHP for us. Now, one way of checking whether this has worked correctly or not is performing the PHP artisan command. Now, let me zoom out a little bit. All right. Now, filament PHP will create a couple artisan commands for you. And if we scroll up a little bit to the F section, where is it? Right here. You will see that filament PHP has added four new artisan commands that we could perform. The first command is useful when you want to set up your assets. The second command is for translations. The third command is to install filament. Quick note, we have only added filament PHP as a composer package so far. We have not installed anything yet. And finally, it has a command to upgrade your filament PHP version to the latest one. Now the most obvious in our case is basically to perform the install command. So let's give it a try. Let's say php artisan filament colon install. And we're going to add a dash dash panels option to it. Now let's hit enter. All right. This has done a couple things for us as it has mentioned right here. It has published the assets which are obviously needed to show the admin panel. It has cleared the configuration cache, the route cache, it has compiled the views, and it was upgraded in case it was needed. Now right now, it's prompting us asking if we want to start the repo. I'm currently not going to do that, but pause the video and show some love to Filament PHP. For now, I'm gonna say no. I want to see whether Filament PHP has added new routes that we could access, since we have successfully installed it right now. So let's say PHP artisan route colon list, all right, you will notice that it has added three new routes for us. Well, a couple more, but three important routes. We have the admin route right here, which is a get request, which should give you access to the dashboard. It has an admin forward slash login route, which is also a get request, which will obviously show a login screen. Then we have the admin forward slash logout route, which is a post request to log out a user. Now there are multiple ways on how you could open your project in the browser. I'm simply going to use my preferred method, which is through Laravel Valet. So I need to say Valet link, add my password right here. All right, it has created a symbolic link. So I can navigate to the browser and open a new tab and open the hostinger filament.test route that I have created. Once we hit enter, you will see that it gives you access to the default Laravel welcome screen. Now, if we change our endpoint to one of the routes that Filament PHP has generated for us, uh, let's say forward slash admin, you will see that we have been redirected to the forward slash admin forward slash login endpoint. And this is happening because we haven't logged in yet. Now, we obviously don't have an account. Well, we don't even have a database connection to store users. So let's set up our database connection before I show you how we could create a user to access the dashboard because it does not support anything to register a user. All right, in PHPStorm, I'm gonna open the .env file in the root of our directory. Right here, we need to change three environment variables. The first environment variable is the db underscore database, which has been set equal to Laravel, or we should set it equal to a database name that we want to use. So in our case, uh, let's say hostinger underscore filament. Then we need to change the db underscore username. My username is root, so I don't need to change it. And finally, we need to change the db underscore password, which should be the password of the user root. And in my case, this is dari1234. Now Laravel has added a pretty cool feature recently. So let's navigate back to iTerm. Now let's perform the PHP artisan migrate command, even though we have not created our database yet. Once we hit enter, you will see that artisan prompted us with a message saying that the database hosting your underscore filament PHP does not exist on the MySQL connection. Would you like to create it? Let's say yes. And as you can see, it has created our database and it has run our migrations. Now let's quickly perform the PHP artisan command for a moment and let's scroll up to the filament section again. Right here, you will see that it does not offer a command to create a user. 
Well, it actually does, but we're looking at the wrong commands. I kind of lied to you, since next to the filament calling commands, it has created a set of commands under the make section. Right here. I'm not going to cover these right now, but we're going to use the make colon filament user command right here. So let's say php artisan make colon filament dash user. All right, it has prompted us with a box asking us for a username. So let's say code with Dari. I need to add my email, which is info at codewithdari.com, and then my secret password, which I won't share with you. All right, Artisan prompted us with a success message. Now with a user that we just created, we should be able to log in on the login screen right here. And honestly, one thing I like about Filament PHP is their incredible design. So let's add our email. So info at codewithdari.com and my password. And I'm gonna tick the remember me checkbox and I'm gonna sign in. As you can see, we're logged in into our admin panel which out of the box comes with a dashboard page with two simple widgets right here. Next to the dashboard page, it offers a drop down in the top right corner. And if we click on it, you can see that we can switch between light mode and dark mode. Or basically the system team, but let's toggle light mode for a moment. And my eyes started to hurt, but it does look kind of nice. Now, the endpoint that Filament PHP uses by default is the forward slash admin endpoint, as you can see right here, which is completely fine by me, but keep in mind that it is super easy to customize this. Filament PHP comes with its own service provider, where you can adjust the endpoint. Let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Let's open the app directory, the providers directory, where you can see that Filament PHP has created a Filament subdirectory. And in here, you will find an admin panel provider. Once we open it, you'll find one pretty important function, which is the panel function right here. It does a lot, and we will cover a lot of the things along the way. You will see that both in the ID and path methods that are chained right here on the panel object, a string of admin have been configured. And if we change this to, let's say, dashboard, and let's change it for the path as well. Navigate to the browser and refresh our forward slash admin endpoint. You will see that we have been prompted with a 404 because the route does not exist anymore. And if we replace admin with let's say dashboard, you will see that we have been redirected to our admin panel again. And honestly, I find dashboard more soothing. So I'll stick to dashboard for now. Now before we wrap up the video, I want to quickly show you one more thing. We most likely won't be using it, but it is important to be aware of. Filament PHP, while Laravel in general, allows you to publish configurations, which basically means that you can copy configuration files from a package or the framework itself into your own application's config directory. This allows you to customize the default behavior of the package or framework to better suit your specific needs. Now to publish a configuration, we need to navigate to the CLI because Artisan needs to help us. And let me perform a clear right here. Now to publish a configuration, you would use the PHP artisan vendor colon publish command. Since there are so many configurations you can publish, Laravel prompts you with a message where you can choose your configuration file. If we scroll down a little bit with our arrow up and down, you will see a complete list of configurations you can publish with filament right here. Now you could either click on a configuration right here and publish it, or you can copy the name. So let's say that we want to publish a tag with the name of filament convic. So let me quit the terminal for a moment. And right here, we can use the PHP artisan vendor colon publish. We're gonna add an option of a double dash tag, which basically represents the tag that you see right here. So if you want to publish a provider, you need to use the provider option, which we will set equal to filament dash Convic. Now, once we hit enter, you will see that it prompted us with a message saying that it has copied the configuration file into convic forward slash filament.php, which is completely fine. Currently, the filament.php dashboard appears empty, 
but this is intentional and completely fine, as it allows for easy customization to suit your preferences. You can adjust the primary color, fonts, change the logo in the top left corner, modify the favicon, and even disable dark modes for the entire admin panel. Let's start off with the most notable one, which is the colors of the admin panel. These needs to be changed inside the filament service provider. Luckily, we got it open. So if you look inside our panel, you will see that it has a method named colors chained to it. Right here, we need to define the color of the entire admin panel. Now by default, filament PHP ships with six predefined colors. And at the moment, they have to find one, which has been set equal to the color amber. The amber color is coming from filament PHP, its color class, as you could see right here. So let's click true on it, where you will find tons of color constants, which are the color options that Tailwind CSS has to offer. Now the values right here are all key value pairs where the key is the color tint and the value is the base color. These tints are created by adjusting the lightness and saturation of the base color, with 50 being the lightest, as you could see right here, where the last one is 950, which is the darkest. Now let's take teal as an example. If the base color is teal, you can use bg teal 50 for a very light slate and bg slate 950 for a very dark teal. This allows you to easily create a consistent color palette with a range of shadows and tints. So let's close off the colors class. Now let's focus on our primary color. Let's replace the amber color that we have with let's say blue. If we then navigate to the browser and refresh it, you will see that the primary color of our admin panel, so basically the dashboard color and the icon has been changed to blue. Obviously, in most cases you want to use a different color than the colors that Tailwind CSS has to offer. Filament PHP allows you to generate your own palette based on a singular hex or RGB value. If we navigate back to PHP Storm, you can see that we could basically remove the color class that they have predefined for us. Let's replace it with a string, where we could pass in a string of a hex value. So let's say hashtag 674cc4. Once we navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you will see that the primary color turned into a purple color. We could also pass in an RGB value as a string. So let's get rid of our hex code and let's pass in the RGB method or we need to pass in 103 comma 76 comma 196. Once we navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you'll see that the color has not been changed. Since we're already inside filament PHP at service provider, let's actually have a look at how we can easily change the font family of our admin panel. If we open the resources directory, the views directory, you will see that filament PHP has not added any views right here. The reason filament PHP does not add it is because it uses the vendor directories to store its views. This is a common practice in PHP packages and libraries where views, assets, and other resources are bundled together in the vendor directory for easy distribution and installation. Now you can't make any changes inside the vendor directory because once you run the composer update command, all your changes will be gone. And we could also not add a link tag of a new Google font inside the head tag of our HTML document to change the font because we only have the welcome.blade.php file. Luckily, we could chain a method to our panel object. So let's say right below the color of, you probably guessed it, font. In case you want to change the font, I recommend downloading it from Google Fonts, store it inside a newly created directory named fonts in either the public or resources directory and use it right here. Quick note, by default, filament PHP uses the inter font. If we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, you will see that the font is still the same. And let me actually zoom in a little bit. If we navigate back to PHP Storm and replace inter with let's say poppins, navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, and right here, you will see that the font has been changed. And honestly, I'm kind of a fan of this Poppins font, so let's keep it as it is. Now, when creating an admin panel, you most likely want to replace a logo with your own as quickly as possible. You might be wondering how you could do that, since I just mentioned that Filament PHP has a view stored inside the vendor directory. 
Now, one advantage of using the vendor directory is the fact that you can easily overwrite certain files. So let's see how this works. If we navigate back to PHPStorm, open the vendor directory for a moment, scroll down and search for the filament directory inside of it, open it. Now let's open the filament directory inside of it. And in here, you will find a couple directories which should sound familiar to you. And one of them is the resources directory. Where you will, you guessed it, store resources such as views, JavaScript files, styling, and many more. Now let's open the views directory for a moment, composer directory, and scroll down again, where right at the bottom, you will find a logo.blades.php file. What we need to do right here is recreating this path inside our own resources directory, where we could overwrite the particular logo.blade.php file. So let's do that. Let's scroll up. Inside our views directory, we're gonna create a new directory. Let's say vendor. And if you add a forward slash right here, it will basically create a subdirectory for you. So let's say filament-panels forward slash components. Now in here, we're gonna create a new file with the name of logo.blade.php. So whatever we add right here, will overwrite the logo.blade.php file inside the vendor directory. It's not required to add an image right here, which you obviously want, but you could even add a string right here. So let's say Hostinger. If we navigate to the browser, refresh it, you will see that Hostinger has been printed out. Now let's navigate back for a moment and let's create an image tag right here. We do need to define the source, just give me a moment. Let's define the alt tag where we're gonna say logo Hostinger. Now let's close off the image tag. Now there are two things that you could do right here for the source. You could just pass in a URL, which I have done right now, and I will add it in the description down below. Navigate to the browser, refresh it. You'll see that it has added hosting or its logo, or we could navigate back to PHPStorm, or what we could do is basically creating a new directory inside the public directory. Let's name it images. What we could do then is basically adding the image inside of it. So pause the video, do that. I will do that too. And I'll see you back once that's done. If your image is located inside a public directory, we could get rid of our URL, use curly brackets, call the asset method and pass in the path from the public directory. So let's say images forward slash hostinger dash logo dot PNG. If we navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you will see that we have added the logo of Hostinger in the top right corner. Now there's one thing that I want to change and that's the size. And since we are using Tailwind CSS, we can simply pass in a class right here of let's say height 16. If we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, you will see that we have changed the size of our logo. We could also change the favicon, which we need to do through the service provider again. So. Let me open my admin panel provider. And let's say right under my font method, I'm gonna chain a new method called favicon. Then we need to add the image path to it. Now, once again, I will store the favicon inside the images directory. I will also add a link to the description for the image so you could download it as well. For now, I'm gonna add a path of images forward slash favicon.png. If we navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you will see in the top left corner right next to dashboard dash Laravel, the title of our page, we have added our favicon icon. Now the final configuration that I would like to show you is disabling dark mode. I'm personally a huge fan of dark mode, so I would never disable it myself, but I do think that it would be nice to show you how that's done. Right inside of our filament PHP service provider, we need to chain the dark mode method to our panel object again where we need to pass in a boolean. By default, dark mode has been enabled, so there's no point of passing in true right here, since it is the default value. But what we could do is basically passing in the value of false, which should turn it off. So let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Let's refresh it. Toggle our icon in the top right corner, where you will see that we can't enable dark mode anymore. Now, like I said, I love dark mode, so I'm gonna enable it again by removing the dark mode method.
Filament PHP currently operates solely as an admin panel. This means that it does not handle migrations and models out of the box. Filament PHP uses the functionalities that Laravel provides. We must first create migrations and models in Laravel before we can use them in Filament PHP. I've mentioned that I simply want to recreate the demo app of Filament PHP. So if we navigate to the browser, open the demo, click on sign in, you will find a couple relationships to the right. We have a tab named products, a tab named customers. A customer can order a product, which will be stored inside the orders tab, where we have two additional tabs, which is categories. And I'm assuming that one product can have multiple categories. And finally, we have the brands, which is associated to one product. So let's navigate to the CLI for a moment. And let's create our model and migrations. The order of the migration does matter as migrations are executed in the order they were created. If a migration depends on a table or column created in the previous migration, it is important to ensure that the previous migration has been executed before running the dependent migration. So for our example, we have to start with the category model and migration. So let's say PHP artisan, make me a new model. Let's name it category and let's add a dash M flag to it. Let's hit enter. Let's hit the arrow up and let's replace the category model with the brand model. The order migration needs to be created after the products and customers model because the relationship depends on those. So let's say PHP artisan, make me a new model. Let's name it product dash M. Let's hit the arrow up again and let's replace product with customer. Uh, let me perform a clear right here. Finally, we need to create the order model and migration. So let's hit the arrow up and let's replace product with order. All right, well, let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Inside the side panel, let's open the database directory, migrations directory, where we're gonna start off with our first migration, which is the categories table. We're gonna keep the primary key of ID as well as the timestamps. And in between, we're gonna use our table object we're going to create a string, so a varchar with the name of name. Then on the line below, we're going to use our table object again. We're going to create a string, which will be the slug, and the slug needs to be unique. Then we're going to create a column where the type method is a foreign ID. So let's say table foreign ID, which creates a new column in the table to store a foreign key. In our current example, we're going to create a parent underscore ID column that references the ID column of the categories table. We're gonna chain a couple methods to it, where the first one will be the nullable method, which allows the column to be null. Then we're gonna chain the constraint method to it, which sets the foreign key constraint to reference the categories table. So we need to pass in a string right here of the table name, which will be categories. Finally, we're going to chain one more method to it, which will be the cascade on delete method, which will specify that when a category is deleted, all categories that reference it as a parent should also be deleted. Now let's add two more columns right here. Let's use our table object and let's create a Boolean with a column name of is underscore visible. And it has a default value of let's say false. We need one more, which will be our table. We're gonna create a long text with a column name of description, and this can be null as well. This will be it for our categories table. So let's open our brands migration. And once again, we're gonna keep our ID and we're gonna keep our timestamps. And in between, we're gonna create a table string with the name of name. We need a slug as well. So let's say table string slug which needs to be unique. Then a brand has its own website URL. So let's create a new string where we will pass in the name of URL and the URL can be nullable. Now I also want to save the color of a brand as a primary hex color. MySQL does not support a field where you can store a hex color. Well, it does as a string. So let's create another string with the name of primary underscore hex, where we will simply add a string value. This field can also be nullable. 
Now I want to add a boolean right here. So let's say boolean with a name of is underscore visible. And this has a default value of false. Now a brand can have a description as well. So let's create that one as well. So let's say description and it can be nullable. All right, let's open the next migration, which will be for the products table. And I'm going to have an in-depth products table as the example of filament PHP, since most of the fields are text fields, and I will be repeating myself every single time in the demo. The process on video should not take too long. So I'm skipping fields such as a compare ad price, cost per item, barcode, security lock, and so on. Right below our primary key, we're gonna define a foreign key with the column name of brand underscore ID. We're gonna constrain it on the table brands and we're gonna chain the cascade on delete methods to it. And let me actually align it on the line below. Now, what does a product have? Well, a product obviously has a name and slug. So let's say table, string, and let's say name. It has a string with the name of slug, which should be once again unique. Then a product has a SKU, which stands for stock keeping unit, and the value can consist of letters and integers. So let's say table, string, SKU, just like the primary key, unique. Then we need to add a description for our product. So let's say table, long text, description, with the value of nullable. We need to add the quantity of a product, which we will use the unsigned big integer method for, with the name of quantity. Then we need to define the price of the product, which will be a decimal. Then I want to add a table boolean, which will be the is visible column, and it has a default value of false. And I'm gonna add one more boolean, so let's say table boolean with a column name of is featured and i'm going to change the default value and obviously not all products are featured by default so let's pass in a false value now the products in our application can have two types it can be a deliverable product or a downloadable product and the way i'm going to define this is through my table object i'm going to create a new enum where the column name will be type where I'm gonna pass a second argument of an array with the values for my type column. So the first one will be deliverable, while the second one will be downloadable. I'm gonna add a default value right here of deliverable. Now the last column that I want to add is a date column with a column name of published underscore at. All right, now let's open our customers migration. And in between the primary key and timestamps, we're gonna add a column, which is a string with a column name of name. And we're gonna use our table string again, which will be the email of the customer, which needs to be unique. Then I'm gonna use a string method again, because I need the phone number of a user. I'm gonna use the table object to create a new date, which will be the date of birth. Then I need the address of a user, which will be a string. I need the zip code of the user. So let's say table string zip code. And finally, I need the city. I actually forgot one thing, and that was defining the enum that we have defined inside our products migration. Now let's create a new directory inside our app directory. And let's name it enums. And inside our enums directory, we're gonna create a new file with the name of product type enum.php. Now the first thing that we need to do inside a new PHP file is defining the opening tag. We're gonna define the namespace, which will be app backslash enums. Then we're gonna define the enum by defining the keyword enum, followed with the name of our enum, which will be the same as the file. So let's say product type enum. We're gonna type int it to a string, where in here we need to define two cases. Case number one will be deliverable in all capitals, which is a string of deliverable. And the second case is downloadable, which will have a value of downloadable in lower cases. 
All right, now let's open our last migration, which is for the orders table. And we're gonna define a foreign key constraint again, which will be the customer underscore ID. It is constraint on the table customers. And we're gonna chain the cascade on the lead method to it. Now the order has a unique number, so let's define a table string with a column name of number and it needs to be unique. It has a total price column, which will be a decimal. So let's say total price 10 and two. It has another column which defines the status, which is an enum of the values pending, processing, completed, and declined. So let's say table enum. It is the status. We're gonna pass in an array with the values of pending, processing, completed, the client, and it has a default, well, let me align it on the line below, of pending. Now we're almost done because we need a column for the shipping price. So let's say table, decimal, the column name is shipping underscore price, and it can be nullable because a product can be downloadable as well. So two more columns. We have a table a long text, which will have a column name of notes. And we have a table soft deletes. There are two things that we need to do for the orders table. We need to create our enum and we need to make sure that we enable the soft delete trade on our order model. Well, I actually need to do three things because I have a small typo right here. All right, now let's scroll up. Let's create a new enum class. Let's name it order status enum.php. Let's create the opening PHP tag. Let's add a namespace of app backslash enums. We're gonna define our enum named order status enum and we're gonna type into it to a string. We have case number one, which is pending, which has a value of a string pending. We have case number two, which will be processing, which has a value of a string processing. Case number three is called completed, which has a value of a string completed. And finally, we have case number four, which is the client, which we need to set equal to a string of the client. All right, now let's open our models directory and let's open our product model. And let's open our order model. So let's add a comma right after the has factory trait and let's name it soft deletes. Now we're obviously not done. We still need to define the fillable property on all of our models and we need to define all the relationships as well. Let's start off with the fillable properties on our models from top to bottom. Now quick note, I know that you can use the guarded property as well, but I personally prefer to use the fillable property over the guarded property because it provides more explicit control over which fields can be mass assigned. With guarded, any field not listed in the array can be mass assigned, which can lead to potential security vulnerabilities. On the other hand, with fillable, only the listed fields can be mass assigned, providing more security and control. In case you want to use the guarded property, it's completely up to you since it won't affect what we're going to do. But for now, let's open our brand model and right below our trade, we're gonna define our protected fillable property, which we're gonna set equal to an array where we need to pass in a couple column names. So let's say name, we have the slug, we have the URL, we have the primary underscore hex, we have the is visible boolean, and we have the description. Now let's move on to our second model, which is the category model. So let's define the protected fillable again, where we're gonna pass in the columns, name, slug, parent underscore ID, is visible, and the description. Then we have the customer model, which has a protected fillable property defined again, with quite a lot of values. So let's say name, email, phone number, well, phone, the date of birth. We have the address. We have the zip underscore code, and we have the city. Let's open our order model, which has a protected fillable property, 
which you have guessed already, with the values of customer underscore ID, the number, the total underscore price, the status, the shipping underscore price, and the notes. Uh, finally, we have the product model. So let's define the protected fillable property. Let's pass in the brand underscore ID, the name, the slug, the SKU, the description, and I want to double check whether I forgot one column. Let's open the products table. And I have actually forgot it, which will be added right below the SKU, which will be a table string of image, which will be the image of the product. So inside our, let's say product model, we're gonna add the image, quantity, the price is visible, is featured, the type, and the published underscore at. All right, the final configuration is the relationships between our models. So let's close off all files that we have open. Now let's open our brand model. So I'm gonna work from top to bottom again. Since one product has one brand, a brand can have multiple products, right? So let's define the first relationship. Let's say product function brands. Well, let's type into it to a has many. Now let's return this has many. And what it has is a product colon colon class. And that's it. Now let's move on to our second model, which is the category model. Well, we said that it can have a relationship with itself, right? It has a parent ID column, which can be nullable. So let's define a public function parent. Let's return this belongs to, and what it belongs to is a category class. But we also need to define the foreign key, which will be parent underscore ID. Let's type into it to a belongs to. And since a category can have a parent as well, it should also have a child. So let's define a public function child, where the child needs to return this has many, and it has many categories as well, where the foreign key is parent underscore ID as well. And let's type into it to a has many. Now we're not done here because we need to define one more relationship. And since a product is associated with one category, one category can have multiple products attached to it. So let's define that relationship as well. Let's say public function products. And let's return this belongs to many. I made a typo and it belongs to the product model. Now let's type into it to a belongs to many. All right. Now the customer model has no relationships for now, but what about our order model? Well, we have only defined one relationship in it, which is the relationship with the customer's table, since one order is made by one user. So let's define a new public function customer, so singular, and let's return this belongs to. And where it belongs to is the customer class. Now let's type into it to a belongs to. And that's it. Now, do you think that we're ready? Well, we actually missed one on purpose, obviously. One order can have many products, while a product can only be attached to one order. So we need to define a one to many relationship. So let's see how we need to define that. Let's go right below our customer function and let's define a public function items method. What we're going to do right here is basically return this has many and we haven't defined what we need to pass in. So let's type in it quickly to a has many. So what about the argument inside the has many method? What I recommend right here is making an order item model, which will define the order ID, product ID, the quantity and the unit price. So let's navigate to the CLI. Now let's say PHP artisan, make me a new model and let's name it order item. And we're gonna add the dash M flag to it. Now let's navigate back to PHP storm. Oh, let's open the recently created migration where we're gonna define a foreign key. So let's say table foreign ID. The foreign ID will have a name of order underscore ID. We're gonna chain the constraint method to it and it constrains the table orders. And 
we're going to change the cascade on the lead method. Then we need to define a second foreign key. So let's say table foreign ID. The foreign ID will be product underscore ID. We're going to chain the constraint method to it with the name of products. And we're going to chain one more method named cascade on the lead. Now we need to add two more columns where the first one will be a table unsigned big integer of quantity. And we're going to define a table decimal for the unit price. Now let's open our newly created order item model where we first need to define our protected fillable property where we're going to set the order ID. We're going to set the product ID. We're going to set the quantity and the unit underscore price. We don't need to define a relationship inside our order item model since the relationship needs to be defined inside the order model. And well, we have to find the method. So the only thing we need to do right here is passing in the order item model and the class. I think that we have one model left, which is the product model. So which relationships do we have right here? Well, a one product is associated with one particular brand. So let's define a new public function brand. So a singular brand where we're going to return this belongs to and it belongs to the brand model. Let's type in it to a belongs to. All right. Now, does it have more? Well, it does have one more relationship, which is between the product and category model where one product can have many categories, but one category can have many products as well. So we need to define a pivot table between the product and category model. So let's navigate to the CLI for one more time. And let's define a PHP artisan, make me a new migration command. Let's name it create underscore category underscore product underscore table. All right, now let's define it by navigating back to PHP storm, opening our migration. And we don't need the primary key for our pivot table. And we also don't need the timestamps. So let's define two foreign keys for the category ID and the product ID. So let's say table foreign ID. The foreign ID is the category underscore ID. It is constrained on the table categories and it needs to be cascade on delete. Now one more, which is the name of product underscore ID. It is constrained on the table products and it is also a cascade on delete. Now let's define one more relationship inside our product model, which is the public function categories. Like I've said, this is a many to many relationship. So let's return this belongs to many and it belongs to many categories. Let's type in this to a belongs to many. And I want to chain one more method to the belongs to many method, which is the width timestamps. The width timestamps method as the created underscore at and the updated underscore at timestamps to the pivot table that connects the product and category model. This allows for tracking when the relationship was created or updated. Now there's one more thing left and that's navigating to the CLI and performing the PHP artisan migrate command. And as you can see, it has migrated all the migrations that we have created in this episode. When working with admin panels, you will hear the term resources quite a lot. And honestly, you can pretty much see it as a resource controller where you can define the CRUD operations and defining relationships between them. Resources and filament PHP is nothing different. They are classes that define the data model for a particular resource, such as a product or a customer, and provide the necessary functionalities to interact with the data. All right, let's get into creating our first resource and see what we can configure with it. Filament PHP has created a command for us, which we can use to create a resource. So let's navigate to the CLI and let's perform the PHP artisan make colon filament resource command. And then we should name our resource. 
Filament resource names should be in singular form and use Pascal case. This means that the first letter of each word in the name should be capitalized, and there should be no underscores or spaces between words. Also, keep in mind that the resource name should be equal to your model name. This is because the resource class is responsible for defining the data model for a specific resource, such as a product or a customer. Personally, I would always say that you should name it the same as the model it represents for clarity and consistency in the code base. So in our case, uh, let's name it product. Now what this command does is creating a new filament directory in the app directory. So let's navigate back to PHPStorm and scroll up. And let me actually close off all the tabs that I have open. All right. Now let's open the app directory where you will see that we have a new filament directory. And once we open it, you will find a resources directory, a product resource directory, and a product resource class. Now this class has been generated based on the command we just performed. It provides the necessary functionalities to interact with the data, such as listing, creating, editing, viewing, and deleting records. This class also extends Filament its resource class. So how does this look behind the scenes? Well, when a user interacts with the resource, Filament PHP uses the project resource class to handle the request and manage the data. If we navigate to the browser for a moment and open our local host, let's refresh it. You will see that Filament PHP has created a products tab for us. Once we open it, you will see that it has created a list overview. Well, we currently don't have any products, so it can't really show anything. And this is happening because we haven't really told our product resource what needs to be shown to the user when they either open the table overview or when they create a new product. So let's get into it right away. Let's see what's going on inside our product resource class. At the top, you will see that Filament PHP added two properties for us, right here. And I'm always quite happy when the naming of properties says a lot. The first property, right here, basically defines the model class which is associated with the class. This is also one of the reasons why I said that you should keep the name of your Filament resource equal to the model itself because filament PHP will detect the model class. Then it has a second property right here, which defines the hero icon in front of the products tab in the left sidebar. Now there are tons of other configurations you can set right here, and there are too many to cover right now. But if you want to check them out, you can simply click through on the resource class, where you will find all available properties right here. Now one cool thing about Filament that I have to mention is that it works without necessarily covering all properties. The question mark that you will see right in front of the data type right here basically indicates that a property can hold a value of either a string or null. Now there are a couple properties that I want to configure and in the demo app you saw that the tabs product categories orders were all grouped together. So let's do that right here as well. On the line below we simply need to overwrite the navigation group property. So let's say protected static string navigation group is equal to let's say shop. Then I want to change the hero icon in front of the products tab right here to hero icon dash o dash bold. Once we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, you will see that we have grouped it under the tab shops. Now you can also change the navigation label. Right now it's products and I'm completely fine by that, but let me show you how you do that. Let's define a protected static string and it's called navigation label. And let's set it equal to let's say test. Once we refresh it, you will see that it has been changed to test. So let's navigate back and let's change it to products. And that was basically it. For now, I want to focus on the two most important methods. We have the form method right here, and we have the table method. Now, the form method defines the fields that will be displayed in the form used to create or edit a resource. The form method defines the fields that will be displayed in the form used to create or edit a resource. Then the table method right here, this method is important because it allows developers to customize how the data is displayed in the table and control which columns are visible to the users. Now, since the first view of a user is the table overview, I want to start inside the table method right here. 
you can see the same structure as with filament its service provider, where it has a couple pre-chain methods on the table object. Through the table object, we can define the columns and other aspects of the table view for a particular resource, right inside of the columns method. It does offer more, which we will cover later on, such as filters, actions, bulk actions, and way more, but for now, well, let's stick with the column. Right here, we basically need to return back an array with the fields. Now before I start off, I've got to mention that you will see me and a lot of others use a text column quite a lot. Now text column is used as a default column type for all field types in filament PHP because it is a versatile column that can handle different data types such as strings, integers and booleans. So let's define it. Let's say text column. We need to import filament backslash tables backslash columns. Then we need to call the make method where we need to pass in the column name. So let's say that the first value of my table overview needs to be the product name. Then we can add a comma right after it and basically define our second column. So let's say text column again. And I want to make the brand dot name. And I know that we haven't covered relationships and we will do that later on, but for now, this will basically look on the brand relationship and it will grab the name of the brand associated with the product. The next field that I want to show is the visibility, which is a Boolean, but I don't want to show true or false to the user. What we can do right here is call the icon column, where we need to pull in filament backslash tables backslash columns. And this is the last time mentioning it because they all come from the same class. We need to make the is visible column. And then we need to chain the boolean method to it. Now, I also want to show the price of a product. So let's say text column again. We're going to make the price. Now, I've got three more left because I also want to show the quantity on the table overview. So let's say text column again. Make me the quantity. Two more. We have the text column again make me the published underscore at and finally let's say text column again where we need to make the type now we're missing one which is the image and it's completely up to you whether you want to show it on the table overview i'll just edit so let's just go right above the name and let's say image column make me the image now if we navigate to the browser and let's refresh it you will see that we're still prompted with a no product screen. So let's quickly navigate back to PHPStorm and connect to our local database to create a product. So I'll do that real quick. Now let me connect to my, where is it? My SQL database. The user is root. My password is Dari1234. Then I have my database name, which is hostinger underscore filament. Once I click on apply and okay, you'll see that I have been connected with my database. And let me close off this panel and let's open the products table. And it's all right if you don't want to create a product, we will create the input fields in a bit so we can create one true filament as well. But for demonstration purposes, it's a little bit easier to show products right now. Now, before we can create our product, you can see that we need to define the brand first because it needs a foreign key constraint. So let's open the brands table. Let's create a new row, let's say one. The name is Hostinger. The slug is Hostinger. The URL is Hostinger.com. The primary hex is hashtag, and I've just pasted it. The visibility is one. The description is just Hostinger, and let's add the timestamps. Let's perform a query. Well, let's close off the brands table and let's create a new product. Let's say ID is one. The brand ID is one as well. The name is VPS hosting. Slug is VPS dash hosting. The SKU is VPS dash a couple of random numbers. The image will be skipped for now. The description is VPS hosting. The quantity is 100. The price is let's say 10. The visibility is true. It is featured and the type is downloadable. It is published right now. And it has been created and updated right now. 
Once we perform a query, you will see that the image column can't be null. So let's basically add a test right here, perform our request, and you will see that we have inserted a new row. Now keep in mind that these are just test products. An actual VPS hosting is a monthly fee that you have to pay or yearly. And working on that functionality basically takes away learning filament PHP, but that can be done in another tutorial if you're interested. Let's navigate back to the browser. Let's refresh it. And right here, you will see that we have defined our first product. And it only shows the columns that we have specifically defined inside the columns method right here. Now, even though we haven't added an image, I do need to mention something real quick. And that's because the image depends on the app underscore URL environment variable inside the .env file. So if we open our .env file, you will see that the app URL is just localhost. In order to show images in filament PHP, you need to set this equal to the URL you're using. So in my case, it will be hostinger-filament.test. Now, even if I go to the browser right now and refresh it, it won't show an image, but it will do it once we create our actual product through the new product button. We're going to cover filters in the next episode. So what I want to do right now is working on the form method, which like I mentioned before, focuses on the views of forms. So basically the fields that will be displayed in the form used to create or edit a resource. Now, if we hover over the row that we have right here, you will see, well, probably not on my screen in the bottom left, that it will redirect you to edit the row. Once we click on it, you will see that this page is empty. And if we navigate back and click on new product, you will see that this page is empty as well. And this is happening because in our editor, if we scroll up in our product resource, you'll see that the form object is empty. So let's start building our form. Just like with a table overview, we're going to start with a product name. We're not going to define a text column this time, but we need to define a text input where we need to pull in filament backslash forms backslash components. We're once again gonna call the make method, which accepts one argument of a string, which is the column name. And in our case, it will be name. If we navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you will see that we have added our first input field, but we somehow need to make sure that we group these. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm and let's remove our input fields for a moment. And the schema method right here is used to define the fields and sections that make up the form or table for a particular resource, right? But next to just simply adding an input field, we could also use the group class, where we also need to make a call to the make method, where on the line below, we need to chain the schema method again, pass in an array, where right here we can define a section. So let's say section, let's pull in the class, we once again need to make a call to the make method and right on our section, we can chain the schema method one more time, where in here we can define our input fields. So let's say text input, make a name. If we navigate back to the browser and refresh it, now let me actually enable dark mode. Yeah, I think this looks a little bit better. You will see that it has added a background well, basically a panel with the input field that we have to find inside our section. So what other fields do we have next to the name? Well, we have the slug, which is also a text input. So let's make it. All right. And we have one more, which is the description. Now, instead of using a text input right here, I want to use the markdown editor of filament PHP with the name of description. And I pretty much assume that we all know what a Markdown Editor is. A Markdown Editor is a text editor designed to simplify the process of writing in Markdown syntax, which can then be converted to HTML. Now let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it. And right here, you will see that we have created a simple panel with three input fields. Now there is a small issue that I've got right here. And that's because the input fields can be placed next to each other instead of below each other, because it's taking quite a lot of space right now, which is unnecessary. Now the schema in filament uses grid for its layout structure. 
So what we could do on our schema method, which is right here, is basically chain the columns method, where we need to specify the number of columns inside of it. So let's say two, since we want the name and slug to be next to each other. But we also need to chain one method on the markdown editor with the name of column span since the markdown should be span full, meaning that it should span both columns. So let's pass in a string of full, and I'll show you right now what I mean. Let's navigate back, refresh it. You'll see that we have defined a grid system of two columns. So column one is the name and column two is the slug. And we said that the description should span over both columns. Now let's create a new panel to the right this time, since that one is empty at the moment. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm, and right below our first group, which ends, I think, right here, we can define a new group. Well, we could define it ourselves, but we could also copy the entire group, paste it right below of it, navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, where you will see that we have added two panels next to each other. Now we don't want the same input fields, so let's navigate back to PHP Storm, Let's delete whatever we have inside the schema method. Now let's also delete the columns that we have added on it. Now right now you will see that the section make method is empty, but we could pass in a string right here, which will basically define the header. So if we say status, navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you will see that the section has a title of status, which is pretty cool in my opinion. So let's navigate back and let's define the fields inside of it. So what do we want to have to the right, which is less important? Well, we want a toggle for the column is underscore visible. Then we want another toggle for the is underscore featured. Now let's define another one, which is a date picker with a column name of published underscore at. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it. And honestly, it's beginning to look pretty nice, right? We have created two panels where we have a couple input fields, toggles, and a timestamp. Now we do need to add a couple more fields and I want to add a panel right below the first panel again. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Now we don't need to make a now we don't need to make a group right below the status because that part will be visible right here. What we want to do is basically create it in the section where we have defined the name, slug, and description. So what we need to do is basically define the entire section that we have right here inside the group schema. So let's go right below the columns and let's paste it right here. Once we navigate back to Google Chrome, and refresh it, you will see that we have added the second panel right below the first panel. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm. And let's delete the columns and let's delete the text input fields that we have as well. So I want to give my section a title of let's say pricing and inventory. And I want to define a couple fields right here. The first one is a text input, make me the SKU. I have another text input, which is for the price. I have another text input again, which is for the quantity. But I also want to give the user the option to select the type, which is either downloadable or deliverable. So for that, I'm going to use a select type. I'm going to make the type and I'm gonna chain the options to it through the options method. Let's pass in an array right here because we do need to define our options where the first option is downloadable and I'm gonna keep the value empty for a moment and the second option is deliverable, which is equal to an empty string as well. Now we could add the values static right here, but we have to find the enum that we can use. So let's say product type enum and let's say downloadable, but I'm gonna get the value from it. And let's do the same thing for deliverable. Let's say product type enum, deliverable value. Now the issue that we have once again is if we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, 
we have four big input fields right below each other. We could basically align them next to each other. And what I want to do right here is chain the columns method to it. And I want two columns next to each other. If we refresh it, you'll see that this looks a lot better. Let's add a new section right below our status right here, where the user has the option to add an image associated with the product. So let's navigate back to, let's say, PHP Storm. Let's go right below our schema. Let's define a new section. Let's make a section with the name of image. We're going to chain the schema method again. We're going to pass in an array where we're going to define the file upload. And we're going to import it. We're going to make an image. And I'm going to chain one more method to it, which is the collapsible method, which I think is necessary because the panel would get way too big. Now let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it where you will see that we have created a pretty cool panel where we can drag and drop our file. We cannot create a product yet because we have not defined a brand ID column. Now this course has an episode on how to set up relationships, but for now, I just want to define the relationship simply as it depends on a value from the brands table. So let's quickly define the relationship without any additional options. So let's navigate back to Google Chrome and let's copy the entire section of image. Let's paste it right below of it. Let's replace the heading with associations and let's get rid of the file input that we have. And I'm simply going to create a select and I'm going to make a brand ID. And then I'm going to chain a method that I want to cover later on, but I have to cover it right now, which is relationship. Now the relationship method accepts two arguments. The first one is the relationship name, which is brand. While the second one is the column, which in our case will be name. And let's get rid of collapsible. All right. I think that we are ready to create our first product. So let's give it a name of cloud hosting. The slug is cloud underscore hosting. The description is cloud hosting as well. It is visible. It is featured and I'm going to publish it today. The SKU is CLO and a couple numbers. The price is 10. The quantity is 100. The type is downloadable. I'm going to add a image. All right. And then I'm going to select the brand. Now let's click on create and right here, you will see that we have been prompted with a message saying that our product has been created. Pretty cool, isn't it? We have finally created our first product through filament PHP. The cool thing about using the form builder. Well, if we navigate back to our products, click on edit on cloud hosting, you will see that it has found the values from the database and it has added it on the fields we have to find. And this is happening because we have passed in the column names to the make method for our component. So let's change the name right here to cloud hosting, let's say two and the slug as well. Scroll down, click on save changes. We have been prompted with a message saying saved. Click on products again, where you will see that the name right here has been updated. Now, so far we have to find the create, read and update functionalities in CRUD. So what do we have left? Well, the last operation is the delete operation. Let's click on a resource or let's say cloud hosting. And in the top right corner, you will see a delete button. So let's confirm it. All right. We have been prompted with a message saying delete it. And you can see that the row has been deleted from our list. If we navigate to the browser and click on new product, a couple things right here seems a bit off to me. Not design or functionality wise, but I personally think that resource modifiers are missing. Resource modifiers in filament PHP or basically in any other admin panel are an important feature that allow developers to modify data in a resource before it is displayed. This is useful for a variety of tasks, such as formatting dates to make them more readable, hiding sensitive data, making fields required or adding computed properties to a resource. 
Now keep in mind that Filament PHP offers tons of resource modifiers, and I know for a fact that I can't cover them all. I basically don't even know them all, but I do want to focus on a couple important ones. Let's navigate back to PHP Storm and let's get started right at the top with the name. Now our entire product relies on the name of the product, right? This is the field that should be displayed to the user and definitely the field where a user decides whether he wants to buy the product or not. Now we can't have products with empty names, so we got to make sure that a name is required. And resource modifiers can be added on the form component. And the form component right here is this line of code. So basically the text input, colon colon make, with the name. Now to make the code more readable, I prefer to add my modifiers on the line below. So let's chain the required method to it. Once we navigate to the browser and refresh it, you will see that the required method has added right here, an asterisk right after the label name, indicating that the field is required. If we try to click on create, you will see that we have been prompted with a message saying that the field cannot be empty. The second modifier that I want to cover is the life method. This method is used to enable or disable life validation for a form field. When life validation is enabled, the form field is validated as the user types, instead of waiting until the form is submitted. In case you want to re-render the form only after the user has finished using the field, you can use the unblur where you need to set it equal to true. The unblur parameter determines whether the validation should occur when the field loses focus or as the user types. And true right here means that the validation will occur when the field loses focus. I made a typo right here because it should be unblur. Now I want to add one more resource modifier right here, which is the unique method. And I think that the name implies what it does. It basically tells the column that, well, the product name that the user tries to enter should be unique. Now the second component field that we have is the slug. And we do need to add a couple modifiers right here. We don't want to give the user the option to add the slug themselves, since the slug is in most cases based on the name of a product. So what we could do right here is chaining the disabled method, which will disable a form field so that the user cannot interact with it. The second method that I want to add right here is the dehydrated method. Dehydration is the process that gets data from the fields in your form and transforms it. The slug, just like the name, should be required as well. And the slug should be unique. Because in general, it is used as a part of the URL for the specific resource. And if there are duplicate slugs, it can create confusion and lead to errors when trying to access the resource. We're not going to keep the unique method empty since we're going to add a couple arguments to it. The first argument is the class, which will be product colon colon class. Then we need to define the column, which is slug. And on top of that, you can set the ignore record where you need to set the value equal to true. This allows the current record to be ignored when checking for uniqueness. Now keep in mind that these arguments are optional. I just wanted to show them to you. Now, if we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you will see that it has not added the value of the slug. This needs to be done inside the name field, since the slug will be generated based on the name. To do so, we need to navigate back to PHP Storm. Right after unique, we need to chain the after state updated method, which is a resource modifier that is used to modify the resource state after it has been updated. It takes a callback function as an argument. So let's say function parentheses curly braces. It accepts a string of operation, which represents the operation that triggered the state update. It accepts a state, which is an array containing the current state of a resource. And it has a forms backslash set object set, which is used to modify the resource state. Let me close off the sidebar for a moment. And in here, we can basically do whatever we want. Let's say if the operation is not equal to create, and the operation is basically the type of request you're trying to perform, 
then outside of it we're going to use our set object then we're going to say set parentheses we're going to set the slug equal to the str facade now let's pull in the illuminate support slug because we're going to create a slug based on the state and the state in our case is the name let's navigate back to google chrome let's refresh it let's type in cloud hosting let's click on well any part of your app where you will see that the slug has been generated based on the name let's see what the next field is we have to find the slug we don't need to add anything for the description but we do need to add a couple modifiers for the sku now for the people who have worked with e-commerces before most likely know what sku is for the developers who haven't sku stands for stock keeping unit it is a unique identifier for a product used in inventory management. It can be a combination of letters, numbers, or both, and is used to track a product's stock level and sales. Now, I personally think that it's good to give some kind of description to the SKU. Now, what Filament allows us to do is basically chaining the label method to it, which will replace the actual label. And you might have already noticed the label right here is generated based on the column name, but you can adjust it through the label method that we have defined right here. So let's pass in a string of SKU parentheses and inside the parentheses, we're gonna add stock keeping unit. Once we navigate to the browser and refresh it, you will see that we have replaced the label to SKU stock keeping unit. Now, next to the label, we're gonna say that our SKU should be unique and it should be required. Now then we have the price, and this is pretty cool because we need to change our text input to a numeric value. If we now get back to Google Chrome, refresh it, you will see that it has added the carrot up and down, and it basically has made it a number input field. Then I want to add a pretty cool method right here, which is the rules method. Now let's say that you want to define custom validation rules for a form field. In Filament, you can chain the rules method. Keep in mind that under the hood, Filament PHP uses Laravel's validation. This means that you can use any Laravel validation form rule with Filament PHP's rule method. This method takes an array of validation rules as its argument, where these validation rules can be used to validate the data entered by the user in the form field. So let's say that we're gonna add a custom regex colon. I'm not going to write it out, but simply copy paste it and I'll add it in the description down below so you can copy paste it as well. And finally, we need to chain the required methods to it. Now, the next field is the quantity field. Now this field should be numeric as well, but instead of saying numeric, we can use the rules method and say that this field should be an integer and it has a minimum value of zero. And this is just to showcase you the power of the rules methods, but let's get rid of it. I want to make it a numeric value and then I want to change the min value to it, which will basically do the same. So let's say zero and keep in mind that the same can be done for the maximum value. So let's chain max value of let's say 100 and let's chain the required method to it. Now for the types, we're simply gonna pass in the required method because I don't want to do anything special right here. Now let's move on to the next section, which is the status. We're gonna add three modifiers for our is visible. The first one is the label, which is used to set the label of the form again. So let's say visibility. Then we're gonna chain the helper text method, which is used to set a helper text for a form field. And in our case, we're going to pass in a string of enable or disable product visibility. Whoops, I made a typo. All right. Finally, I want to chain the default method to it, which is used to set the default value of the form field. And in our case, we're gonna pass in a default value of true, and there's no need to pass in a default value of false because that's the default behavior. So let's navigate back to Google Chrome and let's see how this looks. 
you will see that we have added a string of enable or disable product visibility and it has been enabled by default. Now let's add a couple modifiers for the is featured as well. Well, let's say the label is featured. The helper text is enable or disable products visibility of enable or disable products featured status. All right, we're getting quite far. The final field that I'm gonna cover is the published underscore at. I'm gonna chain the label method to it again because I want a different label. It needs to say availability. I'm gonna chain a default method to it where I'm gonna use the now method inside of it. And the now method is a PHP function that returns the current date and time in the default time zone set on the server where PHP code is running. Now, finally, we have the image right here. And there are tons of modifiers you can add right here. So I will link the documentation down below, but I want to cover four important ones. The first one is the directory method, which is used to set the directory where uploaded files should be stored. So let's say form dash attachments. The second method is the preserve file names method, which is used to preserve the original file names of uploaded files. By default, Filament PHP renames uploaded files to prevent file name collisions. Then I'm gonna chain the image method to it, which is used to indicate that the uploaded file is an image. This basically allows Filament PHP to perform additional validation, such as checking the file's dimensions and MIME type. Finally, we have the coolest method, in my opinion, which is the image editor method, which is used to enable the image editor for the uploaded image. This allows users to crop, resize, rotate, and so on. If we navigate back to the browser, refresh it, and let's actually click on products, Let's upload an image. And right here, you will see an edit icon. Well, let's click on it. And right here, you will see a pretty cool panel opening up where we can do a lot of configurations to our image. But for now, I'm just gonna close it off. Now, these were the modifiers I wanted to cover related to the forms. Filament supports a couple additional modifiers for the table object right here. The first method that I want to cover needs to be added on the name column. So let's chain the searchable method to it. And the searchable method is a table modifier that allows users to search for data within a table column. When this method is applied to a column, it creates a search box on the table overview. Let's refresh it right here. That allows users to search for data within that column. So if we say VPS, you will see that it has created an active filter where it searched for VPS and it has found one row. The second method that I want to chain is the sortable method. The sortable method is a table modifier that allows users to sort data within the table column. When this method is applied to a column, it creates a sort icon on the table overview that allows users to sort the data within that column. And you can see the icon right here. Well, let's move on to the next column, which is the brand name. And right here, I'm simply gonna change the searchable method and the sortable method. But on top of these two, I'm gonna add the toggable method as well. The toggable method is a table modifier that allows users to toggle values within a table column. When this method is applied to a column, it creates a toggle switch on the table overview. So let's refresh it right here. That allows users to quickly enable and disable columns on the table. So if we click on brand, you will see that the brand has been removed from the table overview, which is pretty cool in my opinion, but I do want to show it. Now you can add it for multiple rows. So let's do it for the visibility as well. So we have, let's say, sortable. We have toggable. And I also want to change the label to visibility. Once we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, click on our filters, enable the column, 
you will see that we have added the visibility again. Now let's navigate back and let's add both the toggable and the sortable method on the price as well. And let's do the same thing for the quantity. All right. Now there are different methods on how you can display a daytime. And the one that Filament supports out of the box is pretty fine, right? It outputs the date, but it even offers another option. Once we navigate back and on our published add column, chain the date method. And let's actually also add the sortable method. Navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it. You will see that it has formatted the date in a human readable time. You will see that it has formatted the date to a human readable date. All right, now the final topic that I want to cover are resource filters. Resource filters are used in a table which allows users to filter the data in a table based on specific criteria. It's completely up to you on what type of filter you want to create. But one example might be where users could filter the table to show only products with a certain price range or product that are currently in stock. Currently, we only have one row, so it does not really make sense to use filters. But resource filters are useful with huge amount of data because they allow users to quickly find the information they need without having to manually search through the table. So let's navigate back to PHPStorm and right here, you will see that our table object has a filters method chained to it. Just like columns and field types, filament supports tons of different filter types, which I can't cover all. So I just want to create two simple filters where the first one will be a ternary filter. A ternary filter is a resource filter in filament PHP that allows users to filter data based on three possible values. In most cases, this will be true, false, or blank. An example might be products that are visible. So let's say is visible. We're going to chain the label method to it with the label of visibility. Then we're going to chain the Boolean method to it, followed with the true label, which will be only visible products. And on the line below, we're going to define a false label as well, which will be only hidden products. And we're going to chain the native, which is basically the default, which is false. I made a typo right here. Excuse me. All right. Let's navigate back to the browser and refresh it. And right next to our input field, you will see that it has added a filter. Once we click on it, you will see the label that we have added of visibility. Once we click on the drop down, we can say, well, only show visible products. The final filter that I want to make is a select filter, which is a resource filter in filament PHP that allows users to filter data based on a select box of options. And this is useful for filtering data based on categorical data, such as product types or categories. For us, we can use the relationship that we have defined based on the brands. So let's pass in a brand right here. And let's on the line below, change the relationship method but we need to define the relationship that we have, which is the name of brand, followed with the column that we want to show, which is name. Once we navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you will see that we have created a new filter where we can choose between brands. We currently have one, so if we click on it, you will see that it filters based on the brand. I don't want to make any changes to the product resource that we created since the only thing that we need to configure right here are the relationships which we will do in another episode. And what I want to do right now is to basically navigate to the CLI and I want to create a new resource. So let's say PHP artisan make me a filament dash resource. Now let's name it brand. All right, well, let's navigate back to PHP storm. Let's open the sidebar again because we're going to work in our brand resource class. Now, just like the product resource, I want to define a couple properties first. So let's go right under our navigation icon property and let's define a protected static string named navigation sort. 
In Filament PHP, a navigation sort is a property that defines the order in which a resource appears in the navigation menu. Resources with a lower navigation sort value will appear higher in the menu. And when two or more resources have the same navigation sort value, they will be sorted alphabetically. If I comment out this line and navigate to the browser, refresh it, you will see that we have created a brands tab, which is fine. But let's navigate back to PHP Storm for a moment and let's actually group it inside our shop tab. So let's say protected static string navigation group is equal to shop. If we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you will see that brands have been placed above products. But the actual products that you have in a shop are way more important than the brand. So I rather want to place the products at the top of my list. And that's what we can do through the navigation sort, where we simply need to add an integer value of the sort. And obviously this is not a string, it is an int. That the navigation sort of our brand resource is one. And if we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you will see that brands have been placed down. But I want my products tab to be the first tab that users see. So to fix that, we can navigate back to PHP Storm, copy our navigation sort, Let's navigate to our product resource and let's place it right below our navigation group and let's change the source to zero. All right, now let's open our brand resource again and let's start off with our table method right here where we're gonna define the columns. The first column that I want to show is the text column, which is for the name column. Then I'm gonna change the searchable method to it and I'm also going to change the sortable method to it. Then I have a second column, which is also a text column. The column name will be URL. And I want to change the label because I want it to be more clearer to the user what type of URL is needed. So let's add the uh, label method. And uh, let's say website URL. And now this value is sortable and it's also searchable. Then I want to add another column, which is a color column, because I want to show the primary hex color of a brand. So let's add the column name, which will be primary hex. The primary hex has a label because it needs to be a bit more clearer than primary hex of primary color. We have an icon column, which is for the is visible. So basically the visibility, which is a Boolean. It is sortable and it has a label of visibility. The final column that I want to add is the is a text column, which is for the updated underscore ads. So let's change the date method to it. And let's make it sortable as well. All right. If we navigate to the browser and refresh it, click on the brands tab, you will see that our brands table has been defined and it looks pretty nice, right? Now let's move on to creating and updating a brand. So let's click on new brand and we need to define this page. Let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Let's scroll up in our schema. I want to create a group where I then want to chain another schema to it, pass in an array where I want to define a section. Now the section will not have a name, but we're simply going to define a couple fields inside of it. So let's say text input for our name column. I'm gonna chain a couple methods to it. The first one is required. Well, let's actually navigate to the product resource because it will have the same methods changed to it as the name column right here. And I don't want to rewrite all this code. So let's chain it right here. All right. Then we have our slug. So let's make another text input named slug. The slug will be disabled. The slug will also be dehydrated. And I've covered all these methods in the previous episode, which I will link in the description down below if you want to watch it. The slug is also required, obviously, and it needs to be unique. Now then we need to define the URL. So let's say text input, let's make a URL. We're going to change the label again to website URL. We're going to change the required method to it because the website URL needs to be required. 
it needs to be unique as well and it has a column span of full now there's one more field that i want to define inside this section which is the markdown editor for the description and this one also needs to have a column span of full now we have added a column span for two of our fields so what we need to do is basically chain the columns method of two on our section right here now if we navigate to the browser and refresh it you'll see that we have created pretty much the same panel of creating products which is all right now let's create a brand again all right because we're going to create a group right next to it so let's go right below the column span add a comma where we're going to define a new group where the name will be empty where we're going to chain the schema method on it pass in an array and hit enter now in here we're simply going to create a new section the section name will be status and we're going to chain the schema method on it again where we're going to pass in an array same structure over and over again let's navigate back to google chrome and refresh it and you will see that the status section have been placed right next to the first section that we have created now let's quickly define two fields right here the first one will be a toggle the toggle name will be is underscore visible we're going to chain the label method to it for the visibility we have a helper text of enable or disable brand visibility and we're going to chain the default method to it which is true and i made a typo right here we're going to create one more group and section right below of it where we're going to chain the schema method array which will be a section the section name will be color where we're going to chain the schema method to it in here we're going to create a color picker with the name of primary underscore hex and then we're going to chain the label method to it to rename it to primary color all right now let's navigate back to the browser and refresh it and this looks pretty cool let's create a new brand let's say code with dari the website url will be www.codewithdari.com the description as well and the primary color will be let's say red now let's click on create as you can see our product has been created so let's navigate back to the brands overview now up until this point we haven't really covered what we were supposed to do in this chapter what i want to do right now is focus on a couple actions and the first one is opening a view for a specific brand so let's navigate back to php storm and let's scroll down inside the table method where you will find a where you will find a actions method by default you will see that one action has been defined which is the edit action now this action is the button that you will see right here to the right of every single row once you click on it you will be redirected through an action to the edit page so let's add another action right here let's navigate to php storm and right above of it we're gonna create a view action and let's pull in filament backslash tables backslash actions where we're gonna use the make method again and add a comma right after it if we navigate back to the browser click on brands again and refresh it you will see that we have added a view button right next to our edit button and once we click on one it will open a model where you can view the brand and you even have the option to toggle checkboxes right here now next to the view and edit action it allows one more which honestly speaks for itself since you should also have the option to delete a resource so let's say delete action well, let's once again pull in filament table actions call the make method navigate back to google chrome refresh the page where you will see that it has added the delete button right next to it if we delete our most recent brand and confirm it you will see that we have been prompted with a message saying that our row has been deleted now filament php wouldn't be filament php if it does not let you add tons of customizations to it by default the row axes are rendered at the final cell of each row it even allows you to add it to the left of the table 
So right after the array inside the action method, we're going to add a comma where we're going to define the position, which will be set equal to the actions position before columns. So let's pull it in. All right. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it where you will see that it has been placed to the left side of the table. Now, I don't see a world where I would use this, but it is good to be aware of the customizations you can add. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm and let's get rid of it because I don't want to use it. Now, having these options per row is actually pretty cool, right? View, edit, and delete. But imagine a table with tons of data. This can be quite annoying. Filament PHP allows you to group these actions together. So let's see how this works on the product resource. Let's open it. Scroll to the bottom to our, where is it? Actions method. Uh, let's get rid of our added action. We're going to call the action group. Pass in an array of the actions that we want to add right here. So let's first say view action. Then we have the edit action. And finally, we have the delete action. Now let's navigate to the browser. Well, let's click on products and right here you will see that we have grouped the actions in a drop down which is pretty cool now before i wrap up this video i want to quickly copy the actions that we have navigate to our brand resource and replace it with the action method that we have defined right here and if you navigate back to google chrome click on brands you will see that it has been replaced with a drop down as well Up until this point, we have to find the products and brands resources. I want to continue on with the customers, orders, and categories resources right now, and I want to define it relatively quickly since we should be able to define the table and forms on our resources. Now let's navigate back to the CLI because we need to make a new resource. Let's say PHP Artisan, make me a new filament dash resource, and let's name it customer. All right, let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Let's open our customer resource and let's define a couple properties first. The model property is fine. The navigation icon, I need to change it to hero icon dash O dash user dash group. Then I want to define a protected static int, which is for the navigation sort, where I want to set the value equal to two. And I want to define the navigation group. So let's say protected static, which is a string with the name of navigation group. And the group is shop. All right, this should be enough for now. So let's scroll down to the bottom right inside of the table method. We're going to define the columns or let's say text column for the in name. The name is obviously sortable. And it's also searchable. Then we're going to add the second column, which will also be a text column. The column name will be email. And we're going to chain the sortable and the searchable methods on it. Then we have the phone number of a customer. So let's create a new text column for the phone. We're going to once again chain the sortable method. And we're also going to chain the searchable method to it. Two more because I want to add the city as well. So let's create another text column for the city. It's sortable and it is searchable. Now the last one is the date of birth of a user, which will also be a text column. The column name is date underscore of underscore birth. I'm going to chain the date method to it and it's not searchable, but it is sortable. Nothing fancy. If we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it and open the customers tab, you'll see that we don't see any data. So let's click on new customer and let's define our form. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Or let's scroll up a little bit right inside of the form method. And there's one thing that I want to do different right here. And that's not adding our input fields into groups, which I have done when we defined the product resource and the brand resource. Groups are used to configure multiple fields at once without affecting styling. It basically gives you the ability to save all fields to a relationship or JSON or set them all to use inline labels. 
So personally, I would say that you should add the group when you add a second section to that column, which we don't have in this case. So right here, we're gonna directly create a new section and we're gonna chain the schema method on our section and pass in an array. And let's define a couple input fields right here. The first one will be a text input. The name is for the name. It's gonna have a maximum value of 50 characters and the name is obviously required. Then we're gonna create another text input, which will be for the email. We're gonna give a label to it, which will be email address. We're gonna chain another method to it, which is required. Another method, which is the email method, which will basically do the email validation part for you. Then we're gonna add the unique method to it which has an ignore record of true. Now we have a couple more fields left. So let's create another one, which is a text input. The text input is for the column phone, and it is max value of 50. Now let's add a date picker because we obviously need to add the date of birth as well. We have another field, which is a text input, for the city and the city is required. We have one more, which is a text input, which will be for the zip code and that is required as well. And finally, we have the last text input, which will be for the address. And the address is required and we're gonna add the column span right here. So let's say column span full this only works when we add the columns method on our section and we're going to pass in two columns. If we navigate to the browser and refresh it, you will see that we can create a new customer right here. So let's say code with Dari. Let's add my email address right here. I'm going to add a random phone number. I'm going to add my real date of birth. The city is Utrecht. I'm not going to add my zip code and I'm not going to add my private address. Now let's quickly create one. All right. As you can see, our resource has been created. Let's click on customer and right here, you will see the table overview as well. Now there's one more thing that I want to do right here and that's navigating back to PHP Storm. Scroll down to the table method and let's go right inside of the actions method. Or well, let's get rid of the added action. Let's define a new action group right here. Let's pass in an array and let's define three actions. Let's say view action. All right, let's say edit action. All right, and the last one will be the delete action. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, and right here you will see the three actions that we have defined. Now we have defined the customer's tab, so let's move on by navigating to the CLI and let's define a new PHP artisan make me a filament dash resource and let's name it order. All right, let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Well, let's open our order resource. And right here, we don't need to change the model. We're gonna change the navigation icon to hero icon dash O dash shopping dash back. We're gonna define the navigation sort. So let's say protected static int which is a navigation sort which will be equal to three then i want to define the navigation group as well so let's say protected static string which is for the navigation group which is equal to shop all right let's scroll to the bottom to the table method because i want to define the actions real quick and once again well let's actually navigate to the customer resource and let's copy the actions this is nothing special paste it inside of it. All right. Now let's define the table fields right inside of the columns method. Let's start off with the order number, which is a text column. So let's say number. Let's chain the searchable method to it. And let's also chain the sortable method to it. I want to add another column, which is the customer name, which is through a relationship. So let's say text column. It needs to look on the relationship named customer and it needs to find the name. And this needs to be searchable. It needs to be 
sortable and it is optional so a user can toggle it then i want to add a text column of the status which is the enum that we have defined so let's say status it is searchable and it is also sortable all right let's add a column for the total price so let's say total underscore price let's change the searchable method to it the sortable method and we're going to chain a new method to it which is the summarize method in filament php the summarize method is used to display a summarized value for a column for example you can use the summarize method to display the total sum of a value in a column let's pass in an array inside of it oh, let me scroll down we're going to call the sum method we're going to pull it in from tables backslash columns backslash summarize and then we're going to chain the money method to it now there's one more column that i want to add which is a text column the text column is for the created underscore add we're going to chain the label method to it which will be order date and it obviously needs to be a date all right now let's scroll up and let's define the form fields as well now let's think about it for a moment we have a couple input fields that will enter data in a forms table but we also need to create a screen where we can add products to the order instead of creating a separate page for that functionality we can use a wizard which is a very cool feature that filament php offers a wizard is basically a user interface that will break down complex tasks into smaller more manageable steps it guides the user through each step in a clear and concise manner making it easy for them to complete the task without feeling overwhelmed or confused so let's define our wizard right here let's remove our comment and let's say wizard now let's pull in the filament forms component we're gonna make a wizard where we're gonna pass in an array where we're going to define a wizard step so let's say step now let's pull in a filament backslash forms backslash components backslash wizard and we're going to add a label to our first step of order details then we're going to define a schema on it pass in an array where in here we need to define our fields but before we do that uh, let's define the second step by basically calling the step we're going to name it order items and we're going to change the schema method to it the same stuff over and over where we're going to pass in a comment now before i forget it i want to add the columns span full method on our second step if we navigate back to the browser and refresh it open the order tab and click on new order you will see that we have defined a wizard with two steps step number two is the order details and step number two is the order items once you click on next you will see that step number one has been completed and we're currently on step number two but something has gone wrong with the columns full and i needed to add it on the wizard itself excuse me refresh it and all right this is what you want to see now let's define the fields inside of it starting with the order details it has a text input with the name of number we're going to chain a default value to it which will be a string of or of order dash and we're going to concatenate the random underscore int method which is the php method which should be a random number of 100,000 and let's say 999999 and another nine we're going to add a disabled method to it because the default value will be randomly generated so you don't want to give the user the option to add the order number we're going to add the dehydrated method to it and also the required method then we're going to create the customer id so let's say select for the customer underscore id we're going to chain the relationship method to it because it is a relationship from the customer relationship and we're going to add a second argument which is the column that you want to show to the user which in our case will be name we're not done yet because we're going to chain the searchable method to it and also the required method now we have two more fields left because we have the type of the order as well so let's say select we're going to make a type 
and it has options obviously and the options are basically our enum options so let's say pending which will be order status enum pending and change the value method now let's actually duplicate our line four times the second option will be processing we have completed and we have declined now let's change the order type which will be processing completed and we have declined finally we need to add one more which is for the notes which will be added in a markdown editor and we're going to keep it as it is and we're going to chain one method to it which will be the column span full again and right on our wizard tab we're going to chain the columns method and it needs to be two columns next to each other all right let's navigate back to google chrome refresh it you'll see that this looks pretty dope but let's make the type full span as well so let's say column span full once we refresh it you'll see that this looks pretty good and every time we refresh it you will see a new order number which is pretty cool is there anything missing well let's actually make the type required as well and i think that we're done well, let's continue on with the order items on step number two right here we need to define a relationship with the products table since the data that we will add right here needs to be inserted in the pivot table which was a many-to-many -many relationship so let's define a select the name will be product underscore id which we won't show to the user so let's change the label method to it and let's name it product we're going to chain the options method to it but we're not going to pass in an array but we're going to use our product model we're going to chain the query method to it and we're going to chain the pluck method to it and what we're going to do right here is basically pluck the name and the id now the pluck method is useful here because it allows us to extract a list of values from a specific columns of the products table in our database we're basically going to extract the name and id columns which we then use to populate the options for our select input field in the form. This basically makes it easier for users to select a product by name, while the ID is still used to identify the products in the database. So we have a couple more fields right here. The second field that I want to add is a text input for the quantity. It is numeric. It has a default value of one, and it is required. Now, finally, I want to add the unit price, which will be a text input, unit underscore price. It has a label of unit price. It is disabled. It is dehydrated. It is a numeric value and it is required. Now, right on our wizard, we're gonna chain the columns method, which needs to show three items next to each other. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it. Uh, let's add a type right here. The customer is Dari. And let's add a note of text. Click on next. And right here, you will see our second step. But I have a small issue right here. In our model, we have to find a many-to-many -many relationship, meaning that one order has many items. Right now, we only have the option to define one product. What Filament PHP allows us to do right here is creating a repeater component. And a repeater component is used to create a repeating set of form fields. It allows users to add and remove fields as needed, making it useful for situations where the number of fields required may vary. So what we can do right here is basically navigating back, scroll up to our schema on our, where is it? Order items copy all the fields that we have inside of it remove it for a second and on the schema we're going to create a repeater from filament backslash forms backslash components the repeater has a name of items and we're going to chain the relationship method to it and the schema method to it where we're going to pass in an array paste the fields that we just copied navigate back to google chrome refresh it add a customer again add the option and notes 
And right here, you can see that we have the option to add new items, which will add new boxes where we could select the product quantity and unit price of multiple products. Something went wrong with the styling again. So let's navigate back to PHP store. And what we need to do right here is basically copying the columns and adding it on the repeater. Once we navigate back to Google Chrome, create a new order, add a customer of Dari again, the type, the notes, click on next. And right here, you will see that we have fixed our repeater. If we click on add new item, it will add it right below of it. Pretty cool, but we're not gonna focus on the relationship right now because we will do that in the relationship chapter. So for now, I want to continue on with the categories resource, which will be the simplest one. So let's navigate back to the CLI. Let's perform the PHP artisan make me a filament dash resource. And let's name it category. Let's navigate back to PHP storm. Well, let's close off all tabs that we have opened. Well, let's open our category resource. Now let's start off by defining the properties again. We need the model. The navigation icon will be hero icon dash O dash tag. We're gonna define a protected static int for our navigation sort, which will be equal to four. And finally, we need to define a navigation group. So let's say protected static string, which is navigation group which will be set equal to shop. Now let's open our product resource. Oh, let's copy the actions that we have, open our category resource and scroll to the bottom and replace it inside our actions method. We're gonna define the columns right now, which is pretty straightforward. We have a text column for the category name, which will be sortable and it's also searchable. We need to add a text column because we added a parent relationship dot name because a category can have a parent category. We're gonna chain the label method to it, which will be parent. We're gonna chain the searchable method to it. And we're gonna add the sortable method to it. Now a category can be visible or hidden. So let's define a icon column for the is underscore visible column. We're gonna chain the label method to it, which will be visibility. We're gonna chain the Boolean method to it, and it can be sortable. The final table column will be a text column as well. For the updated underscore add, it is obviously a date. We're gonna chain a new label to it, which will be updated date. And finally, it can be sortable. Now we're almost done because we need to define the form as well. All right, let's first create a group right here. We're gonna chain the schema method to it and pass in an array. Hit enter, create a section right here. Do the same thing. And I actually want to navigate to our product resource and scroll up and copy the slug and the name because it's quite a lot of code that we need to rewrite again. So paste it right here. And right below the slug, we're going to define a markdown editor for the description. And we're gonna chain the column span full method to it. And then on our section, we're gonna chain the columns method where we're gonna add two columns. Now, right below our, what is it? Group, we're gonna define a new group by adding a comma saying group. We're gonna make it chain a schema method to it, pass in an array. And right here, we're gonna define a new section for the status. Let's define the last schema and let's define a toggle. The toggle will be for the is underscore visible column. We're gonna chain the label method to it for the visibility. We're gonna add a helper text of enable or disable category visibility. And finally, we're gonna add a default value of true. I want to add one more field right here where we're gonna give the user the option to select a parent category. So let's say select parent underscore ID. We're gonna chain the relationship method to it, which will be the parent relationship and the name column should be visible. So let's navigate back to Google Chrome. 
let's refresh it click on categories create a new category or let's name it hosting the description will be hosting it is visible and it has no parent because we're going to create our first category and right here you will see that we have been prompted with a message saying that it has been created let's click on categories and you will see that we have created our first category for now i want to wrap up this video where we have to find a customer order and category resources and fill them in php now this was it for today's video if you enjoyed the content and you want to see more please give this video a thumbs up and if you're new to this channel don't forget to hit that subscribe button In huge admin panels, a global search is a must-have feature because it allows users to quickly and easily find specific information across multiple pages or sections of the application. This can greatly improve efficiency and productivity by reducing the time and effort required to locate the desired information. Now most admin panels have two types of searches. The first one is the global search, which allows users to search for information across the entire application. And the second type is a resource search, which allows users to search for information within a specific resource or section of the application. Now we have already covered the resource search right here. Since inside any resource, we said that certain columns should be searchable. Now this works fine, but a global search would be nice too, which allows you to search through all available models in your application. So let's move on with our global search. Now, whenever you want to enable global search on your model, you need to set a title attribute for the resource that you want to make globally searchable. So let's close off our category resource and let's do that inside our product resource first. So right below our navigation sort, we're gonna define a protected static string for the record title attribute. And the value right here needs to be a name of the column on your model that can be used to identify it from others. So in our case, uh, let's set it equal to the name column. Now by setting this property, Filament PHP will know which columns to use when searching for records across the entire application. So if we navigate back to Google Chrome, click on Brands, and in the top right corner, you will see that an input field has been added, which will now represent the global search. So right here, uh, let's search for VPS. And in the dropdown, you will see that it is showing our products of VPS hosting, which is awesome. But uh, let's click on VPS hosting in our products tab, change the description to, let's say, test. Scroll to the bottom, save the changes. All right. Now let's click on the products tab again, click on our global search, write down test. And right here, you will see that it has prompted us with a message saying that no result has been found. And this is correct because we simply set inside our, let's scroll up product resource, that it should search specifically on the name column in our products table. And as you can see, the value of our records title attribute can only be a string. So we can simply replace it with an array, pass in the name, and pass in, let's say, the description. Now to do so, we simply need to overwrite a method that Filament PHP has to offer. So let's define a new public static function. Now let's name it get globally searchable attributes. We need to type in it to a array. All right. Then inside of it. We simply need to return an array, you guessed it, with the column names. So let's say that the name, the slug, and the description needs to be searchable. If we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, search for test, and right inside of the dropdown, you will see that it has added a product because it has found the search phrase in the description table. Now, quick note, you can even add relationships right here. In most cases, I don't recommend doing this because it will kind of mess up the search, but you can simply define the relationship in the same way as we have done before when defining select fields through the dot notation. So let's say brand dot name. Now let's remove it for now. Now let's continue on. 
By default, the global search will output the value that you will have defined inside your record title attributes. But once again, the return value will be a string, so you can't display more information. But filament PHP allows you to overwrite another method. So let's go right below our get globally searchable attributes. And let's overwrite the public static function named get global search result details. Now let's type in it to an array. So we could simply return an empty array right here. And we need to add a parameter, which needs to be an instance of the model that is being searched, which will be model, let's pull in, record. Now this will be an instance of the model that is being searched. This method allows you to overwrite the default behavior of the global search results and display additional information about the record in the search results. So let's say that we're going to return a key value pair and we want to add the brand to the search as well which will be the record, the brand relationship of, in our case, the product's model, and we're gonna output the name. If we navigate to the browser and refresh it, and let's search for, let's say, VPS again, you will see that we have added the VPS hosting title, but we have also added a subheader of brand colon hostinger. You could even add multiple rows where we simply need to add another key value pair, of let's say description, which will be record. So once again, our product model description. Let's test it out. Let's navigate back, refresh it, and let's search for VPS again, where you will see that we have added the brand and the description. Now, I'm personally not a huge fan of it. So let's navigate back and let's remove the description and let's continue on. Now, one thing I wasn't aware of and I learned through Filament PHP as documentation is that the relationship that we have to find right here will be lazy loaded. Lazy loading is a technique in programming where data is loaded only when it is actually needed. In our current example, Filament PHP as global search will be loaded only when they are needed, which can lead to poorer performance. Now, it is recommended to use eager loading right here and it even allows you to do so. With eager loading, data is simply loaded upfront before it is actually needed. In our current example, it is recommended to use eager loading instead of lazy loading to optimize performance. This means the relationship between models should be loaded upfront where the search query is executed instead of waiting until they are actually needed. So let's go right below our get global search results detail. Let's define the public static function named get global search eloquent query which is used to modify the query used to search for records across the entire application we're going to type in it to the builder all right then inside our get global search eloquent query we're going to return the parent colon colon get global search eloquent query where we're going to chain the width method to it, where we're going to pass in one or multiple relationships. So let's pass in an array of the brand. Now you won't see any differences in the browser. So let's search for VPS again, where you will see that the output is pretty much the same. Imagine an application where you have, let's say 100 hosting services. Realistically, you don't want to load all 100 rows to the user, right? you basically want to add a limit to prevent a huge amount of queries. And it's actually quite simple to do that because we simply need to overwrite a property that Filament PHP has to find for us. By default, the global search will show 50 result per resource, which I actually find quite a lot. Let's say that we want to limit it to 20. What we need to do is basically defining a new property. So let's say protected static int which has a name of global search resource limit where we're going to set the value equal to 20. now we can't test it out inside the browser because we only have a total of one product but this is good to be aware of the final configuration i would like to show you is adding search key bindings which i actually find a pretty awesome feature search key bindings are keyboard shortcuts or combinations of keys that trigger specific search related actions 
Honestly, they are useful because they allow users to quickly and easily perform common search tasks without having to navigate through menus or use the mouse to click on buttons. Now let's say that whenever a user hits the command K or control K on a keyboard, the focus of the app will go towards the global search and a user can directly start the search. Now this needs to be configured inside Filament, its service provider. So let's open the providers directory, the filament directory and the admin panel provider, where right under the color, we're gonna chain the global search key bindings method. Right here, we need to pass in an array with our search key bindings. So let's say that the first one is command plus K, while the second one is for Windows and Linux users, which will be CTRL for control plus K. Once we navigate to the browser, refresh it. And since I'm on a Mac, I need to hit the command K buttons. And you will see that we can directly start typing in our global search. Honestly, looking at the navbar right now, I would be completely fine leaving it as it is because you can configure quite a lot through the navigation group, navigation sort, and navigation icon properties. But Filament PHP offers tons of more configurations that you can set. Now let's have a look at the most important ones. Let's navigate back to PHP Storm, and let's close off our admin panel provider, and let's work inside our product resource. Right here, I want to overwrite a new property named protected static string where the name is active navigation icon which allows you to overwrite the default icon for the current navigation item in the navbar so let's set the value equal to hero icon dash o dash check dash batch if we navigate back to the browser and refresh it you will see that the active batch in front of products right here has been changed to the check batch if we click on another tab, you will see that the value from our navigation icon property will be used again. Now this isn't a feature that I want to use, so let's remove it and continue on. The next feature is one that I always use when building admin panels, and that's the use of badges. Badges in admin panel menus are small visual indicators that provide additional information about a menu item. They are typically used to display the count of items that require attention, such as the number of unread messages or the number of incomplete tasks. Badges can be useful because they quickly draw the user's attention to important information and can help them to prioritize their tasks. In Filament PHP, we need to overwrite the public static function named get navigation badge. Let's type in it to a optional string. And then right inside of our methods, we're simply gonna return a string of let's say new. If we navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you will see that we have added a pretty cool badge right next to the products tab named new. Now you could even perform queries right here. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm, where we're gonna remove our string. We're then gonna make a static call to the get model method which will return the model associated with this class, which will be the product model. And then we're gonna add the count method to it, which will basically count all the products that we have. So once we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you will see that the batch has been changed to one, which is pretty useful. Now I want to add another batch, but this one will be for the orders tab. So let's open our order resource. And right below our navigation group, we're going to define a public static function named get navigation badge. We're going to type into it to an optional string. All right. And right here, we're simply going to return the static get model again. But instead of counting it, we're going to add a where clause. And then we're going to count it. And inside the where clause, we're going to check where the state is is equal to processing, which will basically add the count of the orders that are currently being processed, because it doesn't really make sense to add the count of the completed orders. So once we navigate to the browser and refresh it, you will see that the count is currently zero. And if we click on it, you'll see that it is true because we have no orders. The second method I want to cover is quite suiting for the orders tab as well, which is the well, let's go right below of it. 
public static function named get navigation batch color we're going to type into it to an optional string as well now this method is used to set the color of the batch next to the navigation item it does not change the actual content but simply the color of it so let's say that if there are more than 10 orders being processed the color of the batch needs to be changed to red because there are simply too many if it's less we're simply going to keep the primary color as it is so let's say return static colon colon get model colon colon where and let's change the count method to it let's define the where clause real quick where the status is equal to processing if the count is greater than 10 on the line below add a ternary operator of let's say the warning batch and else add the primary batch pretty cool customization right let's navigate back to google chrome and refresh it and right here you'll see that we have less than 10 orders so the primary color has been printed out but if we navigate back and change greater than to less than refresh it you'll see that the primary color has been changed to warning which is a yellow color now for now let's make it greater than again all right now the next configuration is pretty cool as well and that's collapsing the sidebar allowing users to collapse the sidebar in an admin panel can be useful because it gives them more screen to focus on the content they are working on and it's actually pretty simple to do so because we need to configure it inside our admin panel provider so let's say right below our global search key bindings we're going to change the sidebar collapsible on desktop method if we navigate to the browser and refresh it you will see that we have the option to collapse the sidebar right here which is pretty cool once we click on it you will see that the sidebar has been collapsed you could even make the collapse menu your default one by simply chaining the sidebar fully collapsible on desktop method to it but whenever you want to make it work you simply need to delete the sidebar collapsible on desktop method once we refresh it you will see that our menu has been fully collapsed i'm not a fan of it so let's delete it and let's move on now the sidebar has currently been built up based on links that have been defined within our application filament php allows you to add external links to it as well which is pretty cool external links needs to be added inside the admin service provider where you need to chain the navigation items method to it right here we need to pass in an array where we need to define a navigation item colon colon and make in the make method we need to pass in the name of our navigation item so let's say block then on the navigation item you have tons of methods that you can chain on and we're going to start off with the url method, which speaks for itself because you simply need to pass in the url where you want to navigate to so let's say https colon backslash backslash block dot code with dari dot com where we could add a second argument of should open in a new tab where we need to set the value equal to true we could also define an icon so let's change the icon method to it where we need to pass in a hero icon of let's say dash o dash pencil dash square you could even group it just like the shop group so let's say that we want to group it in a tab named external and we can even sort it which will sort the entire group and i want to sort it right after the shop group so right here we can give it a short of let's say two once we navigate to the browser and refresh it you will see that it has added a complete new group named external with my blog inside of it now filament php also allows you to conditionally hide and show navigation items this only works when you define gates we haven't done that so let me quickly show you how the code works that actually won't work so let's navigate back to our navigation item right here now let's chain the visible method to it which is used to conditionally show or hide a navigation item based on a boolean value in here 
we're going to pass in an anonymous function through the fn method. We're going to define a colon bool right here, which is determined by the result of a callback function, which will check if the authenticated user has permission to view the navigation item. Then we're going to set e the value, which will be through the aunt method. We're going to grab the user and we're going to chain the can method, which is used to check if the user has a specific permission. And in this case, we're going to check the view permission, which we haven't defined. So once we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you will see that external has been removed. But if we navigate back, you can even replace the visible method with the hidden method, which will do the opposite. Let's remove the entire line because we don't need it anymore. Now let's say that you don't want to show the categories tab inside the sidebar. This needs to be defined on a specific resource. So let's navigate back to PHPStorm. Let's open the category resource where we need to define a new property. So let's say protected static bool named should register navigation, which has a default value of true because it's obviously visible. So we need to set it equal to false. Once we navigate to Google Chrome and refresh it, you will see that the categories tab has been deleted. Now let's navigate back and delete it. All right. Now let's say that you want to add a navigation item, but you don't want to add them in the left side panel because it belongs to a specific user. And you simply want to add it right under the user icon in the top right corner. To do so, we need to navigate back to our admin service provider where we need to chain the user menu items method. Right here, we need to pass in an array with items that we want to add. So let's say menu item, make. Let's add a label to it, which will be, let's say settings. I don't have a URL right now, so let's add an empty string. Now let's change the icon method, which will be hero icon dash o dash cog dash six dash toot. Once we navigate to the browser and refresh it, click on CD in the top right corner. And right here, you will see that we have added a new menu item named settings. You could even customize the text of the sign out button. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm. And right after our icon, add a comma and say a logout for the menu item, make a new label named a logout. Let's navigate back and refresh it where you will see that sign out has been replaced with logout. Now the final configuration I would like to show you is disabling the breadcrumbs. Right above the resource name, you will always find the breadcrumb. And even when you click on new order, right here, you will see orders and then create. Now you can simply disable this using the breadcrumbs method on your panel object. So right here, let's say breadcrumbs. All right. We need to pass in a Boolean value. The breadcrumbs are obviously shown by default, which means that true is the default value right here. And to disable it, we simply need to pass in false. If we navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you will see that the breadcrumbs have been disabled. But I love the breadcrumbs, so let's navigate back and let's delete the breadcrumbs method. Now we do have quite some relationships, so I think that it would be best to once again start at the top of our resources and move our way down. So right here, you will see that we have to start with a products resource. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Let's close off all the tabs that we have open. Let's open the product resource. And let's also open the product model. All right, let me make the sidebar a little bit smaller. Now we have already defined one relationship right here, which is the easiest one, which is the relationship to the brand model which has a belongs to relationship where one product belongs to one brand. We have done that right inside of our product resource. Let me show it to you. Where is it? Right here. Where we have said that it needs to show a select component. 
for the column brand underscore ID, where we have changed the relationship method, where the relationship name is brand, as you could see right here, and it needs to output the name of the brand. Now the second relationship that we have is the categories relationship, which is a belongs to many relationship with a category model. Now this needs to be defined in almost the same way as with the brand relationship. So let's open our product resource again, and right below our select component, we're going to create another select component, where we're gonna name it categories. We're going to chain the relationship method on it as well, where the relationship name is categories, and the name column needs to be shown to the user. We're not done yet, because we're gonna chain another method to it, which is named multiple, which allows the user to select multiple options from a list. We're almost done because we're gonna chain one more method to it, which is the required method, and let's actually add it on the brand ID as well. Now this should do the trick for us. Oh, let's navigate back to the browser. Before we create a product, let's quickly create two categories. So we have a hosting category, or oh, let's create a cloud hosting. The description is cloud hosting as well. It is visible and the parent is hosting. Let's click on create and create another. Now let's name this one web hosting. And the description as well. It is visible and the parent is hosting again. Let's click on create. Go to our categories overview where you will see that we have one parent category named hosting and two child categories, which is cloud hosting and web hosting. All right, now let's create on products because we're gonna create a new product. Well, let's name it web hosting. The description is web hosting as well. It is visible, it is featured, it is available from today. The SKU is one, the price is one, and the quantity is one as well. It doesn't really matter. The type is downloadable. I have just added the image. We're gonna select a brand of the of hostinger, and we're gonna add two categories. Let's say web, and let's say hosting which is the hosting parent category. If we click on create, you'll see that we run into a small error. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Now let's actually remove the with timestamps method that we have added right here. No idea why we did. Now let's refresh it. Let's actually see if the product has been created. It has, let's delete it for a moment. Let's click on new product. Or well, let's name it web hosting again, same description. It is visible, it is featured, the SKU one, price one, quantity one. I've just added the image, the brand is Hostinger, the category is web, hosting, and let's say hosting. All right, now let's click on create, and well, let's first create a type. Click on create. Now, as you can see, we've been prompted with a message saying that our row has been created. If we click on products, open our web hosting product, scroll down, you will see two categories, hosting and web hosting. Let's navigate back to PHP Storm for a moment. Let's open our database client and let's open the category underscore product table, where right here, you will see that two rows have been inserted with the product ID of the product that we just created and the two categories we selected. All right, well, let's move on to our second resource, which is the brand resource. Now let me close off all the tabs that we have, or let me open the brand resource, and let me also open the brand.php model. Right inside of our model, you will see that we have one relationship, which is a has many relationship with a product's model. Now let's think about it for a moment. Whenever you have a new brand, you want to somehow show the products right below the edit page, or even better, have the option to create a new product directly from a specific brand. So let me show it to you right here. Let's click on brands. So let's say that we have a hosting a brand, but right at the bottom, we want to show the associated products with it. In Filament PHP, this needs to be configured through a feature we haven't covered yet named relation managers. Relation managers in Filament PHP are a way to manage relationships between models. They are useful because they allow you to easily define and manage complex relationships between models without having to write a lot of custom code. 
Now, whenever you want to create a relation manager, you need to navigate to the CLI because right here, we're going to perform the PHP artisan make column filament dash relation dash manager, or we need to pass in three arguments. The first one is the name of the resource class for the parent model, which in our case will be the brand resource. Then we need to add the name of the relationship that you want to manage, which is products. And we need to add the name of the attribute that will be used to identify the product, which will be name. Now, once we hit enter, you'll see that our products relation manager has been created. So let's navigate back to PHP Storm. And since we're already inside our brand resource right here, let's register the relation manager. And let's do that right at the bottom where you will find a get relations method, which returns an array of relation managers for the resource. Now the relation manager can be found inside the brand resource directory because we just specified that, where you will find a relation managers directory with a products relation manager class inside of it. Before we open it, let's quickly register it first. So right here, let's say products relation manager colon colon class. All right, if we navigate to the browser and refresh the edit of our brand, scroll to the bottom, you will see that right below the form, we have added a table which will show all products that are related to the brand that we have selected. Pretty cool, isn't it? We even have the option to create a product right here, which will be directly associated to the brand. And once you click on it, you will see that it will open a new modal where you could create a new product. We haven't defined the fields right here, which we will do in a bit. But for now, let's cancel it because we also have the option to edit a product, which will open the same modal. And we can even delete an associated product all in the same page. Now let's navigate back to PHP Storm and let's open the products relation manager where you will find a pretty familiar class. We have a method called form, which will obviously show the form that you will see right here. And if we scroll down, you'll see a table method, which is the table that is visible right below the form. It has one property inside of it right at the top right here called relationship which is the relationship that is needed to make it work, which obviously refers to the product's relationship inside the brand model. So let's start off inside the table method. And I honestly don't want to define the columns myself again, so let's delete it. Let's open the product's resource, scroll to the bottom, and let's copy all the columns that we have defined right here, because we're basically gonna show the same exact product, right? Paste it right here navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it. And right here, you will see that we can edit our brand, but we could also show the same table that we have on the, on the products resource. Now, the one thing that's bothering me are the actions. So I want to group it. So let's navigate back to PHP storm. And you can basically see that it has the same methods as the actual product resource. So let's copy the two actions that we have. Let's say action group make, pass in an array, paste in the two actions that we have. Let's navigate back, refresh it where right here, you will see that we have grouped the two actions that we have. Now let's continue on with the, what is it? The form builder. And since we're showing a modal and our products form builder has tons of fields, we can't fit them all inside the modal because it will look quite ugly. I do have a pretty cool solution for that. Well, actually not me, but filament PHP. And that's the usage of tabs, which is a way to group related form fields into separate sections within a form. They can be useful to organize large forms into more manageable chunks and make it easier for users to find the fields that they need. So let's define it. Well, let's get rid of the form text input. We're gonna call the tabs component, pull it in call the make method, pass in a name of let's say products. And then we're gonna change the tabs method to it, where right here, we're gonna pass in another array where we have one single tab. Now the tab has a name of information. Let's change the schema method to it. All right. Then right outside of our tab, we're gonna add a comma because we're gonna create a second tab. 
with the name of pricing and inventory. Well, let's change the schema method to it again. Pass in an array, create a third tab, which will be named additional information. Now let's change the schema methods to it. That's it. Well, let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Let's refresh the page. Let's click on new product. But right here, you will see that we have three tabs where we can choose from. To fix the styling, we need to navigate back to PHP Storm and right on our tabs, we're gonna chain the column span full method. Let's test it out one more time. And right here, you will see that we have a full width with three different tabs. So let's define the fields inside of it. Well, I don't want to define the fields myself again, since it will be the same as the product resource, but just in a different order. So I want to copy them from the product's resource. Let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Let's open our product resource and scroll to the form method. Where right here, we're gonna copy the text input name, the slug and the description. Inside our product resource, we're gonna paste it inside the first tab. All right. And then on our tab, we're gonna chain the columns method where it needs to show two columns next to each other. If we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, click on new product, you will see that in our first tab, we have the option to add the name, slug, and the description. Now let's do the same thing for our pricing and inventory. So let's open product resource, or let's copy the SKU, the pricing, the quantity, and the type. Let's navigate back to our products relation manager, Oh, let's paste it inside the second tab that we have. Oh, let's chain the columns method to it where we need to show two columns next to each other. Let's test it out one more time. Click on pricing and inventory where you will see that we have added our text fields. Now let's navigate back because we need to copy a couple more fields for our additional information tab. We're first gonna add the visibility, it is featured and the published underscore at, paste it inside of it. We're not done yet because we're gonna navigate back to our products resource, where we're gonna copy the brand ID and the category ID, paste it right below our published underscore at, and we're almost done because we're gonna open it again. We're gonna scroll up because we still need to add the image. So let's copy it and let's paste it right below our categories field. Now on our tab, we're gonna chain the columns method where we're gonna pass into. And on our image field, we're gonna chain the column span full method. And I think that we're done. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it. Let's click on new product. Let's click on additional information. Let's think about it. Do we actually need the brand ID? Well, we're already located on the actual brand, as you could see in the URI. So there's no need to have the brand input field because it will automatically detect which brand is associated to the product we're gonna create. So what we could do is navigate back to PHP Storm, delete the brand underscore ID select field, navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, new product, where you will see that we have finished our model. Now let's try to create a new product. Uh, let's say test product. It has a description of test product, the pricing all one, the type is downloadable, the additional information is the visibility, the category is hosting, all right, I think that I made a small mistake because the SKU needs to be unique. So let's say test one. Well, let's click on create. I forgot the type. Click on create, where you will see that we have created a product. It has been shown inside the table right below our brand, where you will see that we have added test product and the brand is equal to hosting her. Pretty cool, isn't it? Now let's move on with the third resource we have, which is the customer resource. So let's navigate to PHP Storm, or let's close off all the tabs that we have, or let's open the customer.php model, where right here, 
you will see that we don't have any relationships. So we could move on to the order resource. So let's open our order resource and let's say the order.php. All right, where you will see a couple of relationships. Now we have already defined the customer relationship because inside our order resource right here, we have set that the customer ID is coming from the customer relationship because one customer is related to one order. Now let's navigate to the browser for a moment and click on orders. Now let's click on new order where we have created a wizard step. So let's say the customer is Dari, type is completed and notes is whatever. But on the second wizard step, you will see that we have three fields. Two where the user needs to enter data. So it needs to select a product and a quantity and one that is disabled, which is the unit price. Whenever we select a product, let's do it for a moment, which has a price, the unit price of a selected product should be shown to the user. So let's navigate to PHPStorm and let's start working on that functionality. Well, let's scroll down to our second wizard, which is right here. And let me actually close off the sidebar where you will see that we have a select field for the product ID. Let's chain another method to it, which is required. Then we're going to use the reactive method. In most PHP applications, forms are only reloaded when they are validated or submitted. With the reactive method, you may allow a form to be reloaded when a field is changed. Then we're gonna chain the after state updated, where we're gonna execute a callback function when the value of the product underscore ID field changes. So let's say fn, parentheses, we are going to pass in the state, the forms backslash set, object set, and then we're going to add the arrow notation because on the line below, our set object, the unit price of it, will be equal to the product model, colon, colon, find, where it needs to find the state, which is the product that has been selected. If it can't find one, print out the price, otherwise zero. Now let's navigate back to the browser and test it out. Let's select our customer again, the type and the notes. If we then select a product, you will see that the unit price of a product has been set based on the product that we have found right here. I made a small mistake in one of the first episodes of the series, and that's adding a total underscore price column on the order. After investigating the database, I think that it is a little bit cleaner to calculate this when the user makes a request for it, rather than whenever the order is being made. So let's quickly navigate to iTerm. Now let's create a migration to delete the total price. Let's say PHP artisan make colon migration. Let's name it delete underscore total underscore price underscore from the orders table, where we're gonna specify the table name, which is orders. All right, well, let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Let's open our sidebar, databases directory, migrations. Now let's open the latest migration, where right here, we're gonna define our table, where we're gonna use the drop column method but we're gonna drop the, what is it? Total underscore price. Now let's navigate back to iTerm and let's run the PHP artisan migrate command where you will see that our migration has been migrated, but I still want to show the total price to the user. So what we could do is navigating to PHP storm, opening our order resource, and uh, let's go right below our unit price where we're gonna create a placeholder. The placeholder name will be total underscore price. Well, the field doesn't exist obviously, so let's label the total price, where we're gonna chain the content method to it, where we could basically output whatever we want. So what we're gonna do right here is create a callback function, which accepts a get. All right, and we're gonna return the get, which will basically get the values from the current row. We're gonna get the quantity, which we're gonna multiply with the get 
unit underscore price. All right, now we have four columns right now. Let's change the integer inside the columns method to four. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Refresh it. Oh, let's select a customer, the type, and the notes. All right, you'll see that we have a column named total price. So let's select our product, where you will see that the unit price and the total price have been set. There is a small issue right here, because if we up the quantity, you will see that the total price is not updating whenever we change the quantity. And we have covered how we could do this in the previous episode. Remember, to update it whenever the quantity changes, we need to add a life method on our quantity component. So where is it? Right here. Let's change the life method. And I'm also gonna add the dehydrated method to it. Now we need to make one more change and that's for the unit price right here because it is disabled and disabled fields in filament php will not be submitted into your database because users can eventually change the unit price as well so let's navigate to the browser let's refresh it let's select a type let's add a random note let's select a product let's up the quantity where you will see that the total price changes as well let's add a second item of let's say test product up the quantity as well. Now let's click on create, where you will see that our order has been created. If we click on our orders tab to see the form, you will see that we have forgot to delete the total price column on our form, which is right here. All right, navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, where you will see that our order has been submitted into the database. Is there something missing? Well, let's open our orders table where you will see that the shipping price has been set equal to null. So let's open our order resource for a moment. Oh, let's scroll up right above our type, which is right here, where we're gonna create a new text input. The name is shipping underscore price. We're gonna chain the label method to it where the label is shipping costs. We're gonna chain the dehydrated method to it. We're gonna chain the numeric method to it. And we're also gonna chain the required method to it. Now, small change, because we need to delete the column span full on our type. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Let's create a new order. The shipping price is 10. The customer is Dari. The type is processing. It has a note. I'm gonna choose a random product where I'm gonna add five as a quantity and I'm gonna create it. Click on orders, where you will see that we have created our second order. Navigate to PHP Swarm and let's refresh our orders table where you will see that the shipping price has been inserted as well. Now the final resource with a relationship is the category resource and the category model. So let's close off all tabs. Uh, let's open our, where is it? category resource and the category.php model. All right, and right here, and right here you will see that we have three relationships. We have the parent and the child, which I will skip for now, because I wanna focus on the products relationship. And for this, I want to create a relationship manager because it has a belongs to many relationship. So let's navigate to the CLI, and let's run the PHP artisan make colon filament dash relation dash manager command. It is for the category resource. The relationship name is products and it needs to show the name column. All right, well, let's navigate back to PHP Storm and let's register the relationship manager inside our category resource somewhere at the bottom right here where we're gonna call our products relation manager from the category resource relationship. Now let's open our category resource directory, relation managers, product relation manager. Let's scroll to the bottom. Let's copy our actions because we're gonna group it inside an action group. Pass in an array and paste the two actions that we have. And we can copy both the table and the form methods from the product relationship manager of the brand resource into the product relationship manager. 
of the category resource since it's the same exact relationship. So let's copy the product relation manager from the brand resource. Let's say that we want to copy the entire, well, let's copy the entire form method actually. It's a little bit easier with all the curly braces. Scroll up, paste it inside the form method. All right, scroll down. Then we have our table. Then we have our table columns. Scroll down, which is a little bit easier. So let's copy these. All right, paste it inside the columns method. Navigate back to Google Chrome. Click on categories. Let's click on hosting. Scroll down where you will see the related products. A dashboard is quite important in admin panels because it provides a quick and easy way to view relevant information and metrics in one place. They basically help to identify trends and patterns in data. Think about the average order price, the total number of users, and way more. All of these things are mostly visually shown through widgets and charts. Any filament PHP project shifts with a dashboard page, where you will see two boxes. These boxes are called widgets. And by default, Filament PHP allows you to define four types of widgets. It has a stats overview, which is a widget that displays any data, often numbers, as stats in a row, a chart widget, which displays numeric data in a visual chart, a table widget, which displays a table on your dashboard, and you can create custom widgets, which we won't cover in this episode. Quick note, widgets can also be placed right above your resource table. We won't be covering that in this episode, but it's good for you to know. Let's navigate to the CLI, because we're going to create our first widget with the help of Artisan, which will be a stats widget. So let's say PHP Artisan make colon filament dash widget. We're going to name it stats overview, and we're going to add a dash dash stats option of overview. It's asking us whether we want to add it inside a resource. For now, let's just hit enter because this is an optional option. And it will also prompt you with a question whether you want to create your widget in a dashboard panel or alongside other LiveWire components. We're going to choose the dashboard panel. Now this command has created a new directory and class for us. So let's navigate back to PHPStorm where you will see that a new widgets directory has been created inside the filament directory. Where right here, you will find a stats overview class. Let me actually close off all the tabs that I have open. All right. Now, right inside of the class, you will find a method named getStats, which returns an array of stats to be displayed in a stats overview widget. Now we can pass in a key value pair right here of strings, since we need to use the stat component. So well, let's use our stat component and use the make method. Now it accepts a label and a value. The label will basically be the title shown to you. So let's say total customers. And for the value, we're simply going to pass in 10K. Once we navigate to the browser and refresh our dashboard endpoint, you will see that we have created the simplest widget, which shows the total users, which is 10K. Now we could navigate back and replace our second argument, so the value, with an eloquent query. So let's say customer model, colon, colon, count. Once we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you'll see that the total customers is equal to one. And if we click on customers, you will see that that is correct. There are some additional information that you could pass into your stat components. And let's see which ones you have. We're going to chain the first method, which is the description method. So let's say that the description is increase in customers. We can add a description icon, which will basically be a hero icon. So let's say hero icon dash M dash arrow dash trending dash up. We can add a color of the hero icon. So let's say color is success. And we can pass in the chart method. The chart method on a stat component allows you to display a chart along with the numeric value of the stat. 
the method takes an array of numeric values which will be used to populate the chart so let's pass in a couple random numbers so give me a moment all right once we navigate back to the browser and refresh it you will see that we have improved our stat component quite well now by default the stat will refresh every five seconds so if you quickly create a user and navigate to the browser within five seconds the counter will still be one now i personally think that within huge applications where there are quite some queries this could be customized and refreshed to let's say every 15 seconds to update that we need to overwrite a property so let's navigate back to php storm now right above our get stat method we're going to define a protected static optional string named polling interval where we're going to set the value equal to 15 s for seconds you could even disable it completely where you need to set the value equal to null but that's completely up to you and there's one more property that i want to cover which is the protected static bool named is lazy where i want to set the value equal to true by default widgets are being lazy loaded which you can disable with this property now you could even place multiple widgets next to each other where you simply need to create a new stat right inside of the array so let's name this one total products where the value will be product model colon colon count we're going to change the description method to it which shows total products in app we have the description icon which will be hero icon dash m dash arrow dash trending dash down the color will be something else this time so let's say danger and we have the charts which i will actually copy from above now let's actually create one more before we navigate to the browser and refresh it well, let's say stat make pending orders where the query will be order model where the status is equal to our order status enum pending and we're going to change the value method to it and let's actually copy paste the description description icon color and chart well i actually forgot to change the count method on our query navigate back to google chrome refresh it where you will see three charts the first one is the total customers we have the total products and we have the pending orders now let's move on to the second widget that we can create which is a chart and once again a chart is a widget that displays numeric data in a visual chart it allows you to identify trends and patterns in data making it a useful tool for analyzing information so let's navigate back to iterm now let's create a new widget by saying php artisan make me a new filament dash widget named products chart and we're going to add a dash dash chart to it right here you will see that we have the option to create it inside a resource or oh, let's just hit enter we're going to place it inside a dashboard panel and right here you will see that we have the option to choose between five different types of charts for this example let's choose a line chart and you can modify this later on so don't worry about it let's navigate back to php storm let's open our newly created chart which is the product chart and right here you will see one additional method which is the get type method where you can change the type of the chart for now we're simply going to stick to a line chart so let's set it up inside the get data method we're going to define a data set which is equal to another array where we're going to pass in an array with data with key value pairs so let's say label is equal to blog posts created we have the data which is once again an array with random integers so let's add a couple values right here and then right outside of our data set we're going to add the labels which is also equal to an array and the values right here are strings that represents the label for the x-axis of the chart which in this case are the months of the year so let's say january february march april may and let's actually add one more let's say june 
if we navigate to the browser and refresh it, you will see that we have created a pretty cool chart, isn't it? The design has been messed up, but we will cover that in a bit because I first want to show the data from the database. So let's navigate to PHPStorm. Now let's actually create a new method right below the get type method. Well, let's say private function get products per month. Well, let's type in it to an array. And I'm gonna do this relatively quickly because this is just Laravel code and it takes quite some time to cover all the steps that we're going to perform. So we're first gonna get the current time by defining a new variable named now and setting it equal to carbon, colon, colon, now. We're gonna define a new array, or let's say products per month, which is equal to an empty array. Then we're gonna define a new variable named months, which is equal to the collect method. It ranges from one to 12 and we're gonna map it. We need to pass in a callback function. So let's say function parentheses, but we're gonna use our variable now and our variable products per month. We do need to pass in a variable inside the function, which will be one single month. Variables that we're gonna use, we're gonna add curly braces and hit enter. So we're first gonna get the count. So let's say dollar sign count is equal to product, the product model, where month is created underscore at, and we're then gonna use carbon again. We're gonna parse the now month, but we're gonna pass in the month that we have defined per loop. We're then gonna format it, where the format will be years dash M, and then we're gonna chain the count method to it. Then every time it loops, we need to add the month into the products per month, I made a typo right here. All right, this looks better. So what we can do is basically say, well, products per month brackets is equal to the count. And we're gonna return now month. We're gonna once again, pass in our variable month and chain the format method to it where the format will be capital M for the month. Now on our month variable, we're gonna chain the two array method to it because we're simply gonna use the array inside our get data method. So outside of it, we're gonna return an array where we have two key value pairs. The first key is products per month, where the value is products per month. And we have the months itself, which will be variable months. Then we need to update the get data method where we're first gonna define a variable named data, which we're gonna set equal to this get products per month. We're gonna replace the actual data right here, the array, with our variable data brackets products per month. All right. And then we're gonna replace the labels with data brackets months. Once we navigate to the browser and refresh it, you'll see that we have made a typo right here. So let's scroll down for a moment because the where month needs to be a month with th. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome where you will see that it has defined a pretty nice chart. Well, we actually created all the products in August and September, but that doesn't matter. Just like the sort of the navigation items, we have a sort property that we could overwrite on our widget. So let's navigate back and let's open our stats overview, scroll up. Now let's define a new property. Let's say protected, static, optional int, named sort, which is equal to two. Now let's copy it because we need to place it inside our products chart as well. Right above our gate data method, we're gonna paste it, but the integer value will be equal to three. If we navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it, you'll see that the sort of two has been placed right above the sort of three. Now I want to create one more chart where I want to show the product status in a bar chart, which is also pretty cool, I think. So let's navigate back to iTerm. Now let's perform a clear right here. Uh, let's say PHP artisan, make me a new filament dash widget. Uh, let's name it orders chart dash dash chart. 
I made a typo because it is chart with an H. All right. We're not going to create it inside a resource. It is for the dashboard panel. And this one will be a bar chart. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Let's open our orders chart. Let's paste in the sort that we have, which will be the same sort as our product sort, because we want to place them next to each other, right? So let's navigate back and say tree, where if I refresh it, you'll see that they have them placed right next to each other. Let's navigate back, because we need to focus on the get data method, where I want to show the order statuses in a bar chart format. So let's define a new variable named data. Let's set it equal to the order model. We're going to select the status and we're going to perform a DB query, which is a raw one where we want to get the count as count. And then we're going to change the group by method to it because we're going to group it by the status and we're going to pluck the count and the status, and we're gonna chain the two array methods to it. All right, inside our return statement, we're once again gonna define a data sets, which is equal to an array, where we're gonna pass in an array with a label of orders. We have data, which will come from array underscore values, our variable data that we have defined right here, and then we're going to pass in the labels on the bar chart, which will come from our order status enum cases. Pretty cool. Let's navigate back, refresh it, where right here you will see that we have two pending orders. We've got one more left, which is a table widget. Now let's say that we want to show the latest orders in a table format right below our charts. Let's navigate back to iTerm. Let's perform a clear. Let's say PHP Artisan make me a new filament dash widget named latest orders. And I'm going to add a dash dash table to it. We're not going to create a page inside a resource page. It is for the dashboard panel. And as you can see, it has been created successfully. Let's navigate back to PHP Storm. Open our latest order. We're first going to define the sort, so let's say protected, static, int, dollar sign, sort is 4. And right here, you will find the same table method as we have seen before within our resources. Now, before we define the columns, oh, let's define the query first, which will set the query that will be used to populate a table, which will come from our order resource. And we're going to use the get eloquent query method right here. Then we're going to change the default pagination page options method, which will set the number of items that will be displayed per page. In our case, we're simply going to pass in five. Then we're going to change the default sort method to it, which sets the default sorting of the table. We're going to say, look at the created underscore add column and sort it in a descending order. And then we're going to focus on the columns method, which will take an array of column objects. And I don't want to define it myself, so I'm going to open the order resource, scroll down to the table methods, and copy the text columns that we have, navigate to my latest orders, paste it right here, navigate to the browser, or refresh it, scroll down, where you will see that the styling got a little bit messed up. But we can fix this by navigating back to our PHP storm. Inside our latest order, define another property. So let's say protected int pipe string pipe array named column span, where the value will be set equal to full. If we navigate back, refresh it, scroll to the bottom, you will indeed see that it has been full spanned and the latest orders are visible. A plugin is basically a component that adds a specific feature or functionality to an existing system or application. Filament PHP has tons of features and you most likely won't need any plugins when you want to build simple applications. 
but sometimes you just want to extend the functionality of the framework. One pretty cool feature that Filament PHP has, well, let's open a new tab. Now let's say filamentphp.com is that they have a plugins tab on their official website. Right here, you will find a total of 97 plugins that they offer. Now keep in mind that these are not all created by the developers of Filament PHP itself. Since Filament PHP is open source, there are tons of packages that have been created by contributors. Now, one package that I want to install is named Excel Export, which has been created by, and I hope that I'm pronouncing his name right, Dennis Koch. When you open any package in Filament PHP, you will find tons of documentation on it, from available methods, installation, custom stuff, and way more. For now, I want to open the installation part, which is through Composer, so let's copy it. Let's navigate to iTerm. Let's paste it right here and hit enter. All right. And what I want to do is configuring an Excel export on my order resource. Since maybe a company might want to print out the orders, which can be done through an Excel format. So let's see how this works. Let's navigate to PHPStorm. Let's close off all the files that we have open and open our order resource. And you don't want to have the option to only select individual rows and export them. Filament PHP allows you to perform an action on multiple records at once through the bulk action method right here. So what we simply need to do right here is right above the delete bulk action is use the export bulk action. If we navigate to the browser and navigate to our local host, click on orders, you don't see any option where we could basically export it. And that's because we need to select the rows first. We could either select single rows or all rows. Right here, you will see that a button popped up named bulk actions. And once you click on it, you will see the export option. Now, once we click on export, you'll see that it has exported a Excel formatted file of our orders. Now I've just got out the part where I've opened it in Google Drive. And once I open it, you'll see the result right here. We have exported the number, customer status, and order date. You've got tons of other configurations, which I recommend you could check out through the official documentation of the package itself. The second package that I want to cover is named Spotlight. And as you can see, it has been created by the same author named Dennis Koch. This package basically allows you to easily search through your application's actions. So let's scroll down and let's copy the composer require, navigate to iTerm, paste it right here. This package does not work out of the box because we need to register it inside our panel configuration. So well, let's open our, where is it? Providers directory, admin panel provider, and anywhere, let's say right under the user menu items, we're gonna chain the plugins method, pass in an array where we could add multiple plugins. The plugin that I want to add is called Spotlight Plugin Make. Now let's navigate to the browser. Let's open our local host. And this package offers four commands that you can perform to open Spotlight, which I will show you on the screen right now. If I press on command K, you will see that Spotlight just opened. So let's say that we want to search for product. Right here, you will see that it has added the three CRUD operations of a product. We can open the list, we can open a create field, and we can open an edit field. So let's say create, where you will see that we have been redirected to the page where we could create a new product. A VPS stands for Virtual Private Server, which is a type of hosting that uses virtualization technology to create several virtual servers on a single physical server. Each virtual server works independently with its own operating system, CPU, and ROM, allowing users to have more control and customization over their server environment compared to shared hosting. Now you might wonder what advantages hosting a Laravel application on a VPS hosting has since there are many different hosting options. It includes greater control and customization over the server environment, as each virtual server works independently with its own operating system, CPU, and ROM. 
This allows for more efficient resource utilization and better performance compared to shared hosting. Now, as you might have noticed throughout this entire course, we're going to use Hostinger as our hosting provider. Hostinger is a web hosting provider, but it even adds more to that. You could set up a shared hosting, cloud hosting, VPS hosting, email hosting, and SSL certificates. But those aren't specifically the reason why you should choose Hostinger, since there are tons of other web hosting providers available on the web. So let's talk about a couple advantages regarding the VPS hosting. So in the browser, let's go to Hostinger and VPS hosting. And if we scroll down, you'll find a couple advantages right here. And the first one, in my opinion, is the biggest one because it's regarding their storage and processors. With the cutting edge technology that it offers, you can experience rock solid performance for your web projects. And the best part, it's available on industry leading HPE and DELL servers spread across four continents. You also have full ownership of your hardware resources thanks to the industry standard KVM virtualization platform. So if you have an exciting project ID, I think that this is incredible to have. Secondly, Hostinger offers lightning fast speed and reliable uptime. With their fiber connected infrastructure, Hostinger offers a blazing fast 300 MB per second network speed. This makes VPS hosting a pretty solid choice when it comes to building e-commerce, gaming platforms, streaming platforms, or pretty much anyone who needs a lightning fast website loading speed. Finally, it's backup and snapshots. At Hostinger, your data is safe with their automated weekly backups. This means that you can rest assured that your data is protected in case of any unexpected errors or issue. But what if you need to perform major changes to your system? This is where manual snapshots come in. With Hostinger, you can easily create a manual snapshot of your system at any time. This gives you the ability to revert to a previous version of your system within minutes in case anything goes wrong. Overall, having backups on snapshot is crucial when it comes to VPS hosting. With Hostinger's reliable and easy to use backup and snapshot features, you can ensure that your data is always safe and secure. Now on this page, if we scroll up, you will find four different packages that Hostinger has to offer regarding VPS hosting. All packages have their own discount, ranging from 57% to 63%. Now looking at the prices, I got to say that the prices are pretty affordable when it comes to hosting. If you host a Laravel project on cloud hosting, you most likely will pay a little bit less or maybe even the same depending on where you're going to host your project. If we look at the features that these have to offer, You'll see that the bottom five are featured on all the packages. It offers AI assistant. It obviously offers full root access. It offers a dedicated IP address, which basically means that an IP address is assigned to a single virtual private server instead of being shared among multiple servers. This has tons of advantages because it allows for greater control and customization over the server environment, as well as increased security and flexibility and it offers a weekly backup. Now, what about the advantages that will change depending on the price? You will receive more bandwidth, and bandwidth refers to the amount of data that can be transferred between your website and your visitors within a certain amount of time, typically measured in gigabytes per month. This completely depends on whatever you need for your application. A website with low traffic and small files may be fine with one GB of bandwidth but a website with low traffic and small files may be fine with one GB of bandwidth, but a website with higher traffic or larger files may require significantly more bandwidth to function properly. Secondly, it offers NVMe SSD storage, which is a type of high performance storage technology that uses non volatile Memory Express, so NVMe, protocols to communicate with a computer's processor. It also provides faster data transfer speed and lower latency than traditional hard disk drives and even traditional solid state drives. For smaller projects or websites, 50 GB might be more than enough. However, for larger projects or websites with a lot of media files, 15 GB may not be sufficient. It's important to consider your specific storage needs when choosing a hosting package. They also offer a variable of RAM, and RAM stands for Random Access Memory, which is a type of computer memory that allows data to be read and written quickly. It is a crucial component for running applications and programs on a computer. For smaller projects or websites, 4GB might be sufficient. 
However, for larger projects or applications that require more resources, 4GB might not be enough. Finally, they offer different vCPU cores. vCPU stands for Virtual Central Processing Unit. It's a number of processing cores that are available to your virtual server. The amount of vCPU cores that you'll need will depend on the specific requirement of your project, such as the amount of traffic that you will expect and the complexity of your application that you will be running. In my opinion, a good starting point is to choose a hosting package that offers at least two vCPU cores and then scale up as needed. Which brings us to a dubio, right? The filament PHP project we created can easily be hosted on a KVM1 package. But personally, I would choose using two vCPU cores. So let's choose the KVM2 package. So let's add it to our card. Right here, you have two options. You could either choose to pay for 12 months or you could pay for a single month, which makes the price more expensive since it will be $18.99. Quick note, Hostinger offers a 30 day money back guarantee, which allows you to test it out and see whether any type of hosting suits your requirements. Honestly, I love hosting providers that give me the option to host a project for a month. You obviously need to host a project for longer, but having the option to test out different hosting options is a huge plus in my opinion because you can test out different types before you make a final decision. Personally, I think that a 12 month plan is more profitable, so I'm gonna stick to the 12 month deal. And if we scroll down to step number two, you will find an overview of the services you're gonna purchase. We have a plan, which has a discount of 58%. It is a total of $116.01, but, but there is always a but, right under the total, you'll find a have a coupon code link. And once we click on it, you'll see that it opens a input field with a button where you can add the coupon code of code with Dari. Apply it where you will see that the discount has been changed to 62 because it will give you an additional 10% discount. Paying around $100 for 12 month VPS hosting is a great deal. For now, we're going to add the payment credentials right here and I'll see you back once you have created your account. All right. After purchasing my VPS hosting, I've been redirected to this page where I can start the setup. So let's click on start now. And right here, you will see that it's prompting us with a question asking us to select the location for our VPS hosting. The location of a VPS hosting server can and will have impact on website loading speeds and overall performance. This is because the physical distance between the server and the user can affect the amount of time it takes for data to travel back and forth. So you basically have to select a location closer to your target audience. So it will ensure faster loading time and better user experience. Since I'm currently located in the Netherlands, I'm going to choose the Netherlands right here. Now let's click on continue. All right. And for the next step, it's asking us to choose an operating system. There are three options right here. And one of them is an option that we're not going to use, which is the one to the right because it's for WordPress. So we're left with the OS with control panel and a plain operating system. Now, come on, we're developers. I completely understand that you want an OS with control panel, but I personally prefer to use a plain OS so I can use a VPS manager that I want to use to connect later on. So in our case, oh, let's click on plain OS. The next step is for the type of control panel we would like to use. And right here, we need to select the operating system for our VPS hosting. You will see three recommended options, but you have a complete list of other options. You have Debian, Rocky, and Ubuntu. Regarding Linux and Ubuntu, they are both operating systems based on the Unix operating system. Linux is an open source operating system that is available in many different distributions. While Ubuntu is a specific distribution of Linux, the choice between Linux and Ubuntu would depend on your specific needs and preferences as well as the compatibility of the control panel you choose. I personally have always used with Ubuntu and I don't really have a specific reason for that. So I just want to stick to that as well. So let's click on Ubuntu. Let's click on continue. For the next step, we need to set up our VPS host name, our root password, and we have the option to add an SSH key. So we can change our VPS host name. We can do that later on. Let's create a secure root password and I'm going to leave the SSH key option open right now. So let's click on save and continue. 
it's showing us an overview of what we have selected. The VPS location is in the Netherlands. The operating system is Ubuntu and the host name is well generated by Hostinger. So let's finish our setup and this will take a moment or two. So pause the video and I'll see you back once that's done. All right, as you could see, we're located on our H panel where you will see an overview of the server. On the VPS information tab, you will find your dedicated IP address right here, the status of your VPS, which is running, which has not been set because our VPS has just been created, the current operating system, the location, and the node. In the SSH access tab, you will find information on how you can access your application through SSH. You will find your IP address, the user, the password, the port, the IPv6, and the terminal command to access your SSH. Now on the final tab, which is plan details, you will find some information that we have covered before. But one pretty cool feature about VPS that I want to show you is the manage VPS section right at the bottom, where you can upgrade your VPS on the go. In other words, it's scalable, meaning that you can upgrade your plan without having any trouble. In case you want to do that, you simply need to click on upgrade VPS. Now I don't want to cover all the tabs to the left right here, because we do need to continue on with the installation part, which needs to be done through a VPS manager. A VPS manager is a tool that allows you to manage your virtual private server through a graphical interface. It provides an easy way to perform tasks such as installing software, configuring settings, and managing files. Now the VPS manager that I recommend is named Server Avatar. I'm not going to cover the setup part because it is pretty straightforward. I'm simply going to log into my server avatar and continue from there. So pause the video and continue on when you're ready. As you can see, I'm currently logged into my server avatar account where I can connect to a new VPS hosting. So let's click on create. Now let's say server. All right. Like I've just mentioned, Server Avatar is a VPS manager tool that allows you to manage your virtual private server through a graphical interface. And I think that the screen right here should make a lot of sense for most developers. You can connect to a custom server, but you can also choose between Amazon, DigitalOcean, and a couple other options. What we need to do is selecting the custom server because we have our hosting provider, which is Hostinger. Then we need to add the server name which we can find in our overview, the VPS information, right at the top, which is the server name that has been auto created for us. So let's paste it right here. Then we need to add our IP address, which we could also find inside our panel right here. So let's copy it and paste it right here. Then we need to add our root password, which we have created, but in case you have forgot your password already, you can navigate to SSH access, and change it right here. This will take up to 60 minutes, so I'm not gonna perform that. I'm simply gonna add the password that I have created. The SSH port is 22 by default, and if we navigate to our overview, you will see that the default SSH port is 22. Then we need to select our tech stack, and I want to use Apache, so I'm simply gonna use the LAMP option. I want a database of MySQL, and I want to install Node.js. Makes sense, right? The typical setup when you want to deploy a Laravel application, but this time on a VPS server. Let's click on connect now. All right, as you could see, we're connected to our VPS and the installation part right here might take a bit. So once again, pause the video and I will see you back once this is done. All right, as you could see right here, our environment has been set up and there are so many configurations you could see and configure right here from databases to server loads to memory usage to disk usage and even to application users. I can't cover these all, so I want to continue on by setting up our project. I want to deploy my project through Git. So let's quickly click on the integrations tab in the sidebar where you can see that you can link your Bitbucket, GitHub and GitLab accounts. I want to choose a link my GitHub account. So give me a moment. And as you can see, my GitHub account has successfully been linked to my server avatar. So let's click on the servers tab. Now let's click on the server that we have created. 
Now, the next step is creating an application. So inside the sidebar, you will see applications. Well, let's click on it. Well, let's create a new application. And I'm gonna make a test project. So I'm going to enter a basic application name. Oh, let's say Hostinger Filament PHP. It will be on a test domain. And the test domain will also be Hostinger Filament PHP. Now let's click on next step. Well, apparently my subdomain has already been created. So let's say Hostinger Filament. Next step. All right. For the second step, we need to select a method and how we want to deploy our project into our application. I have added my project into a GitHub repository, which you will find right here. So what I can do right here is click on Git, select the service provider, which will be GitHub, where you will see a couple options that we could add. And here comes the tricky part. Whenever you are working with a private repository, you need to add a deploy key to your project. Right now, my repository right here is, where is it? Private. But once this video goes live, I will change the visibility to public. And if we navigate back to server avatar and click on public, you will see that we don't need to add the deploy key. And you can simply use the HTTPS URL that you can find right here to clone this project. Now, this is the easiest method, but in 99% of the cases, your repository will be private. So let's set that up before we continue on. In GitHub, let's click on the settings tab, where in the left sidebar, right under security, you will find a deploy keys option. And once you click on it, you'll see a new option where you can add your deploy key. Right here, we need to create a new title and add a deploy key through server avatar. So let's navigate back to server avatar, click on private, say generate SSH key. Well, let's copy it. Well, let's navigate back to GitHub. Well, let's name it server avatar. Let's paste our SSH key inside the key text area. There's no need to add server avatar right access. So let's add our key. All right, as you could see, it has been added. All right, as you could see right here, our deploy key has been successfully added. So let's navigate back to server avatar because we need to select our account, which will be info at codewidari.com. Let's select the repository, which will be hosting our dash filament. And we need to select a branch, which will be the master branch. And then you have the option to add a deploy script. Now, whenever you open my GitHub repository, which I have linked in the description down below, you will find the deploy key as well, but I will keep the steps right here relatively easily. So let's add a couple commands right here. Let's say git pull. After the git pull, we need to clone the .env.example file. So let's say cp.env.example to a file named .env. We're gonna run the php artisan key colon generate command. We're gonna install or update composer. So let's say composer install dash dash no dash dev dash dash optimize dash auto loader. We're then gonna run php artisan route cache, php artisan cache clear, and finally php artisan migrate. Now let's click on next step. Then we need to choose our system user. I don't recommend using admin right here. So let's choose new user. Let's name it code with Dari and the password will be very secret. Click on next step. Then we need to select our PHP version for Laravel 10 plus. I'm always gonna use PHP 8.2. Let's click on next step. Now let's review it for a moment and everything seems fine. So let's say create application. Now there's one more setting that I want to update real quick. So let's navigate to servers. Let's open our server. Now let's click on settings right here because I want to update the PHP CLI version to 8.2 as well. Now, if we think about it for a moment, there are some steps that we have missed, right? We haven't created a database and we most definitely haven't set it up inside our .env file. So let's click on databases. And right here, we're gonna create a new database. We're gonna name it Hostinger Filament. We're gonna set up a custom username and password, where the username will be code with Dari, and you will see my password in a bit, which will be test12345. 
exclamation mark. We're not going to add the remote IP. So let's click on create a database. And as you can see, we have been prompted with a message saying that our database has been created successfully. So what we could do right now is navigating to our applications, open our hosting or filament PHP app, where we have an option in the sidebar, which says file manager. Once we open it, you'll see a familiar structure. So open the public.html file where we need to show hidden files. And right here, you will see the .env file. And once you open it, you can edit it right here. So I'm going to keep it simple right here. I'm going to change the database name to Hostinger Filament. The user is code with Dari and the password is test1234 explanation mark. Let's click on save. It takes five seconds. So give it a moment. Click on yes, I'm sure. All right. Now, if we navigate back to our application, you'll see that somewhere if it shows up, we'll open our project first. It has a primary domain. And once we click on it, you'll see a forbidden, which means that the error code is 403. This is happening because Laravel doesn't really understand our project structure. And we can create a new hidden file named HD access. So let's navigate back and let's open our file manager again, the public underscore HTML. Let's say create a new file. Let's name it dot HD access. Let's tick the show hidden files checkbox. Let's open our dot HD access file. And I'll just add a piece of code right here as a comment, since it's very easy to make mistakes right there. So just follow along or copy the comments or from my repository. So I'm going to paste it right here. I'm going to click on save changes. I'm going to wait five more seconds. All right. Uh, yes, I'm sure. If I navigate back to my local host and refresh it, you will see the second error, which is a 500 error. And this is happening because our deploy script couldn't be performed since we had no database connection. So what we can do is two options, change it in server avatar, or we could open our VPS, copy our terminal command, navigate to a terminal, paste it right here and hit enter. I do want to use a fingerprint. So let's say yes. My password is a password that I have added myself. And as you can see, I have been connected. So what I need to do right here is change directories into my home directory. If I perform an LS, you will see a code with Dari directory. So let's say CD code with Dari. If we perform another LS, you will find the directory that we have created ourselves. So let's say CD hostinger, another LS, open the public directory, perform another LS where you will see a Laravel project. So pretty straightforward right here. Let's say composer update. All right. It's installing all packages that are required. Then we need to run the PHP artisan key colon generate command. Finally, we can run the PHP artisan optimized colon clear command. Once we navigate back to the browser, open our local host and refresh it you will see that our Laravel project is visible in the browser. If we change the endpoint to dashboard, you will see that our filament PHP project is available. Now this was it for the video of my filament PHP video series. Once again, don't forget to use my discount code of code with Ari when you're going to subscribe to a plan of Hostinger, where you will get a 10% discount of any hosting plan. And if you do like my content and you want to see more, Leave this video a thumbs up and if you're new to this channel, please hit that subscribe button.